Okay, members, you're very welcome to the meeting of the Education Committee today. Uh, can I ask members if they're aware of any apologies? William Humphrey. I'm aware that we have an apology from William Humphrey, Clark, and we can record that accordingly. Yep. Thank you. Okay, members, chairperson's business. Uh, can I agenda item 2.1, post-primary transfer? Can I advise members of recent press reports which indicate that a number of post-primary schools which uh, routinely make use of academic selection to determine some or all of their enrolment have elected to set aside the post-primary primary transfer test for 2020. Um, remind members that the committee has written to the department suggesting that it issues guidance to schools in respect of post-primary transfer in order to avoid confusion uh, and legal and other challenges. Uh, our response is uh, still awaited in relation to that matter. Um, I, I just address a, a, an update with regards to the chairperson's liaison group that I attend on behalf of the committee. Um, the chairperson of the chairperson's liaison group uh, gave a, a general reminder and reprimand yesterday to assembly committee chairpersons on committee timekeeping, length of committees, length of chairpersons questions, length of committee members questions. And the chairperson of the communities committee legitimately complained about the impact of the length of the Education Committee on preparation for the Communities Committee. I personally apologise to the Chairperson of the Communities Committee and, and recognise that that wasn't acceptable. Um, I won't, however, apologise for the extent of the work of this Education Committee, given the extent of the issues facing education. Um, it's my understanding that in line with guidance from next week, we will have this room to the later time of 1 p.m., which should help address some of these issues. Uh, I also note that the Justice Committee has decided to meet twice a week currently. That being said, we have the room today to 12.30 p.m. with three really important evidence sessions uh, with the Association of School and College Leaders. Uh, the Council for Curriculum, Examinations and Assessments and the Department of Education. Uh, that gives us approximately 60 minutes per session um, with the members in attendance today, approximately four to five minutes for members questioning. I will, in light of all of the above, do my best to keep us to those timings um, and to help us to continue to scrutinise the the work of the Education Department as best as I can. I seek your cooperation members to help me to do that by yeah. a avoiding too many preambles and repetition of questions, which we do our best to achieve. And I thank you for the scrutiny that this committee has achieved to date. Uh, someone want to make a comment there? Yeah, Chair, it's Daniel here. Just to echo some of the words that you've used there, and also uh, 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 to uh, add force to the argument that the work that we are doing in this committee is absolutely vital in the public interest, certainly in our teachers' interest, in our schools' interest, and absolutely in the interest of our children. Uh, and it's not easy uh, to get through the various questions and points that members need to raise uh, in order to draw attention to the real critical issues that exist within our education system at present. Uh, so I, I will not be apologising in any way. I think this is critical work that our committee do, and I think we do it extremely well uh, within the time that we have. Uh, appreciate that, Daniel. Uh, members content to proceed? Content. Okay, thank you. Agenda item three, draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 27th of May 2020 at page six and seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Can I advise members that there are no matters arising? And move to agenda item five, which is our evidence session with the Association of School and College Leaders. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the committee clerk and thank the committee clerk for that briefing paper at page 14, a paper from the Association of School and College Leaders at page 21, an extract from the Executive's Coronavirus Recovery Plan at page 28, an NAHT NI paper relating to the Restart Programme at page 30, and NEU briefing papers on the lockdown and restart at page 39. Can I confirm then that we have Mr Trevor Robinson, 
President of the Association of School and College Leaders, and Mr. Stephen Black, Executive Member of the Association of School and College Leaders with us. Trevor, Stephen. They were there earlier. I'm not getting much feedback, is that? No. Members, can you hear me? Oh no. Uh, Okay, right. something's gone skew with right okay. We're having a technical issue, so we will seek to address that as a matter of urgency, members, and seek your, your patience as we do so. Hold on if I can get Christine. If I just push the button here for a second, if it's okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland. No We're live. Thanks, Clark. Okay, I think we've resolved the technical issue, members. And uh, to recap, we are very glad to have Mr. Trevor Robinson, President of the Association of School and College Leaders, and Mr. Stephen Black, Executive Member of the Association of School and College Leaders, with us today. ASCL represents school leaders uh, from different prim post primary schools across Northern Ireland. All have children and young people undertaking GCSE and A-levels. All are considering the issues and challenges relating to the phased restart of school attendance from August 2020. And the Education Committee, therefore, is delighted uh, that you're able to attend the committee today and um, to give us your views on these important matters. Thanks very much indeed, and I invite you to brief our committee for no more than 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, this is Trevor Robinson. I'm the, the President of ASCO Northern Ireland. I'm Headmaster of Lurgan College, which is a 14 to 19 controlled grammar school. And I'm joined by my colleague uh, Stephen Black, former President of ASCO Northern Ireland, Headmaster of Ballymena Academy, which is an 11 to 18 voluntary grammar school. Uh, I did hear your opening remarks, um, Chairman, uh, in relation to the work of the committee. And I would also like to place on record uh, the appreciation of uh, principals and teachers throughout the province for the crucial work which you are doing uh, in these very strange times. Um, our association is uh, a leading professional body. We have over 20,000 members um, across, the, across the UK and we are responsible for the education of more than 4 million young people. In Northern Ireland itself, we have approximately 200 members in more than 80 post-primary schools and significantly as across all sectors, total enrolment of which equates to almost half of all of the pupils in our secondary schools. Um, our strap line is we speak on behalf of our members and we act on behalf of our young people and this will, this, that strap line uh, and uh, all the thinking behind it will become evident as we present here today. Um, we do very much enjoy and continue to enjoy a very healthy and a beneficial uh, relationship and dialogue with, with SIA uh, and with the Department of Education and with the Education Authority and we do not seek in any way today um, to contrive any major conflict with, with any of those organisations, but simply to highlight concerns that we have to ensure that what are potential issues don't actually become um, a reality. Um, our, we have four key issues um, in particular, and we do acknowledge we live in very unprecedented times. We know that we're doing, uh, everyone's doing their best to navigate their, through, their way through these uncharted waters. Uh, as they draw plans and strategies which have been forged in, in extremis. Um, it is important, however, that you hear our grave concerns that we have on uh, a number of key issues, um, none of which will come as a major issue to SEA or to the Department of Education. Um, I will lead uh, on the first two uh, regarding cohort variation and the appeals process, uh, and then Stephen will come in afterwards with the remaining two relating to the reopening of schools and qualifications in 2021. On the 16th of April 2020, the Minister stated that his priority 
uh, was to ensure that pupils receive fair results that reflect their hard work and enable judgments to be made about their future. We fear that that um, aspiration that, or that commitment could be potentially seriously under threat if SIA do not take account of cohort variation. In certain centres throughout the province, there has been significant improvement in pupil attainment uh, uh, this year. And we want, and, and if, uh, this, if this is, if Cognizant is not taken of this, this could lead to a real injustice and act as a severe blow to the school improvement uh, agenda. Each principal will be asked, when, when submitting results, uh, to state that, that the results that the centre has come up with honestly and fairly represent the grades that these students would have been most likely to achieve if they set the exams. But we must also at the same time agree that if the profile of the grades are different from what might have been expected based on past results and the prior attainment of this year's students, then the grades from my centre will be adjusted. We find this potentially a contradiction, particularly if a centre has irrefutable evidence to demonstrate that the 2020 cohort is stronger or indeed weaker. And we even go further to say that the impact could be felt even more acutely in our non-selective schools, of, of, of which we have a number of members in our, in our association who are subject year and year to significant um, variation. Now, we do have to accept that variation is there, um, and we see it uh, from year to year as principals. It is seen by ETI, and they refer in their, in their inspection reports to dips, uh, and they accept. So if ETI and if the profession accepts that there are cohort variations, then obviously we would be asking for SIA um, to do the same. We have encouraged all of our um, members uh, to make sure that all of their marks and grades are put in our objective and are honest, uh, stating that the process will only work if the profession works together in a consistent, fair and ethical way. Uh, we believe that our students deserve nothing, le nothing less than that. Um, we do believe that, that, uh, that also see a need to take cognizance of small cohorts or, and, small, and small classes, where obviously if you've only three people in a class, that can have a significant impact on percentages. Um, we do believe that it should be possible to see it would have some sort of appropriate levels of tolerance. And if centres' grades are out of tolerance, we would ask that SIA seek additional information from the centres which support why the grades are higher than has been the case in the past. We do want to make sure that the sins of previous generations are not visited upon this generation. So that is in relation to the cohort variation and the question we would have for SIA, and, and there's another question really at the back of this as well, but which is what guarantees can be provided to ensure that no individual candidate who is fairly assessed by his or her centre will not be disadvantaged by being awarded the grade which she, he or she d deserves and is reflective of his or her ability by any statistical adjustment to bring results in line with the previous cohorts. We have, we, we, we have no understanding, we have been given no information yet in relation to this, math this uh, mathematical model, uh, the, the process. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know what it's going to take into, into account. We don't know if it's going to average the previous three years. And it is important that we know uh, exactly what that model would look like um, to avoid the impression of some form of dark arts being performed. So that is uh, my um, issue in relation to cohort variation. In relation to the appeals process um, itself, there has been a consultation in relation to this by SIA, and we can broadly accept the logic in most respects. But we have grave, grave concern about one area in particular, um, given that Ofqual um, had said, had decided that exceptionally for this year, they considered that they would prevent exam boards from putting grades down where errors affecting students, all of those named in the appeal, are discovered uh, through the application of the process. We found it most bizarre that SIA would present or would propose that the rank order uh, is integral to the statistical process and therefore to ensuring that standards are maintained. Um, if the rank order, see as said, is changed for a candidate in a centre in the post-results period, it can have an adverse effect on the statistical outcomes and therefore on standards across the cohort. 
and then the most worrying thing of all. It is therefore in the, in the interest of standardisation across the cohort and fairness to all candidates that if a rank order position for one candidate in a subject is changed as a result of an appeal, it should affect the other candidate's rank order in the centre to take account of this change. This would mean a change of grade for those displaced in the rank order of, uh, as a result of the appeal. We believe, as an association, that practice would be absolutely and utterly unacceptable and that no grade, no grade issued on the 13th of August or on the 20th of August would be secure and would be subject to change. I mean, you don't even want to imagine the impact that that would have on our young people who would be celebrating getting their place in university on the basis of the grades and then suddenly because someone else uh, they're, because someone else's grade has been upgraded and they have dropped down. We, we say that the rank order is absolutely inviolate and sacrosanct and, um, and it, should not, it should not be interfered with. So our question for SIA would be can SIA guarantee that the grades of other students other than those named in the appeal will not be adjusted where errors have been detected in the application of grades by applicants? And we do believe that by SIA uh, uh, Reviewing this, um, they would be demonstrating that they are genuinely listening to an association which is very, very concerned about the impact of this on our young people. I refer again to our strap line. We do speak on behalf of our members. This is what our members are telling us. But we are acting on behalf of the young people, and we want to protect them first and foremost. And I hand over to my colleague, Stephen Black. Well, uh, thank you, and, and thanks again to the committee for the opportunity for us to speak, uh, speak here today. And I want to echo what, what, what Trevor has said as well, in that we have been, we have been very much in, in consultation with the Department of Education, with SIA, with ETI, on a lot of issues moving forward, and, and, and I think that relationship has been valuable in putting down some of the plans that are already in place in a number of the areas that, that we're talking about. And I think we were particularly pleased then to, to welcome the correspondence yesterday evening from the Minister in relation to the reopening of schools and indicating some of the steps that the Department might take to, to address some of the issues in which we were seeking clarity and indeed some of the issues which we have referred to within the paper, the briefing paper, which, which you have got in front of you. I think, again, to echo what, what, what Trevor said, yeah, I think that, that, that there, there's a growing sense in the community at large that young people are perhaps those with most to lose following this pandemic, and they could be the unwitting victims of it all. And, and I think in, in that sense, I think as an association, and certainly in my own school, we very much support a strategy based on obviously a cautious approach and based on on health and safety, but an, an approach which would allow pupils to return to school uh, at, at the earliest date it's safe to do so, and it now looks like that is going to be in late August, based on the scientific evidence. But also we think that it is important that that, that takes place alongside consideration of the other harms caused by the ongoing restrictions. Now for us, I think there, there are a number of details of clarity that I think are still important. Uh, the Minister has talked about, about late August as being a potential starting point. Now, in, t in terms of schools like ourselves uh, and the schools we represent, we would have, we would have staff in schools from, from obviously A-level results have been issued on the 13th of August, GCSEs on the 20th of August, and indeed we would normally start with some pupils in as early as the 24th or 25th of August. However, if, if, if that date is going to be changed somewhat, I think it's important that we get clarity on that, as much for the school, but equally for the parents out there who are going to be having to manage that situation with their young people as well. So I think we would be important to get that. It's very clear to us, and it's evident again also in the Minister's statement yesterday, that stringent social distancing is going to be very, very difficult to achieve. And I think that in, in that regard, we're delighted that the, that the practitioners group has been set up to address that. And there are a number of our colleagues and the ASCAL executive are, are involved in that. Because I think only by doing that can we provide the confidence and clarity that's needed for staff, pupils and parents as they return to school. But probably for us, there, there's such a plethora of issues to be addressed that it's really important, I think, for schools and in particular for those young people to know that we get as much clarity as soon as possible to enable that reopening 
to, in, in, in very, very difficult circumstances, to work well in each individual school. And each individual school will have its own issues to deal with. In all schools, we're looking at, at the accommodation within classrooms, the introduction of possible one-way systems, increasing our hand sanitizing, and so on and so on. And the list, in many ways, is endless. But, but for us, we are examining all that. But the more clarity we get around issues, it allows us to develop those. And probably one of the most important in those is the whole idea of how many young people we can safely accommodate in school. It's very different what's happening in, in, in different jurisdictions in terms of the number of people that happens. And it is very much based on, that, on the social distancing requirements that are there. One of my other colleagues was quoted in the media uh, last week as saying that, you know, if social distancing remains at two metres, it's going to be very, very challenging in schools. And I would go beyond that and say that actually it would almost become, it would really nearly be unmanageable for schools if, 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 if it's as strict as that in terms of the interpretation. So if that's to be the case, then I think for schools planning, we really need to be planning much more of our blended delivery will be online than it would be if those requirements were to be reduced. So for us, I think it's important that we get clarity as soon as possible to allow us to do the planning in, in that regard. So for us, as a question out of that. We would like a guarantee that we would get clear, as clear direction as possible in the circumstances by mid-June on a number of the issues around the reopening of schools. Tied into that, I think then, and, and, and very important within the post-primary sector, is the whole issue of the examinations for the pupils in 2021. And I think this is exercising people in, in, all, in, in, in all countries at the minute. Uh, reading uh, the, one of the, in the Dublin Press on Sunday, there was a major article in it about teachers' fear for pupils in the 2021 exams and was outlining the plans that the Department of Education in Dublin were taking to ensure that appropriate curricula were taught and that appropriate exams are in place. I think it's very clear to us that it will be impossible for all the normal content and all the normal subjects to be taught to all the pupils in, in the way that, 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 that would normally take place, given the amount of time that pupils will have missed from school. But equally, I think, taking account that in some subjects, the act it will actually be impractical to necessarily address some of those issues. Now, we understand that there are issues in comparability in exams from year to year. We understand the complexities that we have in Northern Ireland, where people set exams which are set by examination boards in England and also those set by CCA. But I think it's imperative for the young people that we really get, get to grips with what will be on offer for those young people next year and how we are going to try to accommodate them and ensure that they are not feeling anxiety about not being able to cover all the courses that they need to cover and be assessed fairly on those. Now, that could, the, the, the ways in, there are a number of ways in looking at that. Obviously, content is an issue because different schools cover content in different orders. But I think there are different ways in which the content and particularly the methods of assessment could be looked at. But for us, I think, I think everyone sees that that's going to have to happen. But for the teachers who are planning to teach those people next year and who are going to be asked questions as soon as young people return about well, what's happening in my GCSE? What's happening in my A-level? I think it's important for, for us to make sure that the work is going on around that and that, again, if teachers are to plan for that and return in September and be properly planned to help those people with their, young, with their exams moving forward, that we can get confirmation from CCA and, indeed, other examination boards that officers are engaged in detailed research consultation with principals and heads of departments about the changes that might be needed to ensure that those young people have a fair opportunity to, to achieve next year. So, so that really is the question we leave on our, on our fourth issue. Thank okay. you. Thanks very much indeed, uh, gentlemen. Um, we're a little over time already, thanks to me. Um, so I'll keep us moving along. Um, I, I, I am grateful for the the issues that you've raised and the, the questions that are there <coughs> that we can put to SIA and the Department of Education. Um, I just have one qu uh, additional question before I move to members, and that is whether um, you'd like to make any comment with regards to um, the post-primary transfer process 
uh, for 2021 and the state of uh, selective schools contingency plans um, for post-primary transfer tests, um, given the current circumstances? Uh, Chairman, um, as I've already alluded to, ASCO Northern Ireland's membership is drawn from all school types, including all ability, selective, non-selective post-primary schools, 11 to 14s, 14 to 16s, 14 to 18s, 11 to 16s, 11 to 18 year groups. The association does not have a position on academic selection, uh, which of course is clearly inextricably linked to this issue. Uh, furthermore, it is an issue for, or a matter for individual Board of Governors um, to decide on this issue, and it would not, we believe, to be, be helpful or appropriate for us to express a view, personal or professional, um, on this matter at this time. Okay, fair enough. A anything to say in regards to the extent of which any of your members are at least considering contingency planning? No. Uh, I Again, uh, you know, we, we have different schools doing, doing different things. Okay. Uh, schools will be in different places. And because it is essentially an issue for governors and admissions criteria are determined by governors, I really feel that anything we might say at the minute uh, could be um, misinterpreted or viewed as unhelpful or inappropriate. OK, thank you. And that, as I say, thank you for the, the, the rich and important issues that you have raised otherwise there that we are, will be able to raise with CN and Department of Education. Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Trevor and Stephen, for coming to committee today, uh, your briefing paper and um, uh, your outline there. I don't really have any questions because um, I, I think that most of the concerns that you have raised, I share and others in the committee have shared, we have raised them and we will be raising them in the further briefings today, um, uh, just to sort of say that no way agree in relation to the statistical calculation um, and that I believe that the, the, the schools and the children who are at most disadvantaged will be further disadvantaged, so I agree with you on that. Share your concerns around the appeals process, um, and also, Stephen, in relation, you highlighted your points, your part around reopening the schools and the clarity of guidance, and uh, you know that must come out uh, by mid June at the latest. Um, you know, we're hearing very clearly from all our unions and principals and others. We need time to prepare, um, and parents and young people need clear guidance and clarity about going forward. In relation for exams for 2021, I raised this last week with the officials, and I expect more details today from CIA, so share your same concerns on that. Um, I know that I have, an hour, I have a meeting that's done with you, so um, we can discuss it in further detail, and just thank you so much to, for that today. It has been really, really useful. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Robin Newton? Are you on mute, Robin? Oh. Robin, are you thank on you, mute? Sir. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, I, much the same as the Deputy Chair, I, I think we, we are all interested in uh, protecting our young people, and I agree with the, the, the comments in terms of a plethora of issues and uh, requiring a clear direction. Can I just ask the question, it's a general question, not specific, uh, that the discussions that are being had with SIA and wider are all constructive discussions? Uh, Chairman, yes, they, they absolutely are. And I did um, allude at the start to the very healthy and beneficial dialogue and relationship that we enjoy with SIA and, in fact, with the Department and with the Education Authority as well. Um, obviously, we will continue uh, to engage. Um, we will continue to have, to have dialogue. Um, but we just felt it was important today, given that, now, also, obviously, remember that uh, we didn't ask to appear before you today. We were invited um, as a result of our engagement um, with uh, uh, our political parties. And I think it is just important, uh, you know, that we place on record as well that, that these, uh, these are issues that we have now made you aware of. These are issues that are going to become a reality. And these are issues that are going to affect young people, parents, constituents, and our whole community. And now that you've been made aware of these, um, 
we really do very much look forward to you continuing to do the crucial work and, and, and for which we give you our thanks. We are all operating in very, very difficult circumstances. But you're aware of these issues, and we really do need these issues to be sorted. Um, because if they're not sorted, then we're going to have serious injustice. We can cope with many things. We can cope with people making mistakes. We are all human. We all make mistakes. But what we cannot cope with in relation to examination results or anything else in life is that feeling of unfairness, where a child has worked really hard, the professional judgment of the teacher supports that, and then suddenly a computer overrides that. Um, so we are working with SIA, we are working with the Department of Education, um, and we have, uh, I mean, and again, I, mean, I must say, uh, in relation to the Minister, he has uh, put himself out there uh, more than any other Minister of Education I remember, um, that he's been Zooming schools, he's been talking to people. I mean, uh, I also said, you know, they're not, these are not issues that all of these folks are not aware of. But there are issues that we need answers to. And as my colleague um, Stephen Black has just said, uh, particularly in relation to the reopening of schools, we need answers now. I mean, we are behind England um, uh, in relation to pupils going back to schools. As you're aware, the primary school pupils have gone back. Um, this, the, the secondary school pupils, year 10 and year 12 for them, or year 11 and year 13 for us, are going back on the 15th of June. And they still are awaiting uh, some guidance from, and, and this has to be in writing, I and mean, this, this has to be very formal guidance directives coming from the department to tell us even things like quotas. I mean, at the minute, our colleagues in England, their best guess may be that it's about 25%, a quarter of the year group. Well, if it's a quarter of the year group that is due to come back, well then tell us it's a quarter of the year group and give us the time to plan. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'm content with that. Thanks, Robin. Uh, Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Trevor and Stephen. Uh, can I just put firmly on record that I am I'm one of those members that was extremely and highly impressed by the presentation and the detail uh, uh, of the presentation that you provided to me and, and uh, David Canning in more recent times, and I deeply appreciate the time that you and your colleagues have taken in order to uh, uh, share with us your concerns, which I found to be very, very direct and very reflective of the overall crisis facing education during this pandemic. So thank you for the presentation and thank you as well for being here today. I do think your evidence session will be very, very important. Uh, just a, in relation to uh, a, few, a few things, in relation to children returning to school, uh, Trevor, what would, you need to, what would you need to have in place? Uh, is it doable within the September time frame, for instance? Um, well, uh, maybe I'll let Stephen lead on that and then I'll come in on the back of that, if that's OK. Daniel, I think, I think from our point of view, obviously, I have said, you know, we've said, we're, we're, we're on the record there as saying that we want to get young people back into school as, as soon as it's safe to do so. And we do believe that it will be possible to get children back into school in September. But the, the, more, the more clarity we get around, around what, what we're permitted to do and in terms of the arrangements for young people mixing together and so on, it allows us to plan much more appropriately. You know, I, we have done here, I, and I know that other colleagues have done the same, I, I have a, we have looked at a number of different ways in which we'd accommodate young people, and the number, of, the number of, of those young people we can accommodate in a classroom varies very differently depending on, on, on the level of social distancing that has to be applied. And I, I, I said that earlier, but, but for us, therefore, to get some sort of clarity on issues like that are very, very important. Equally, I think that there are issues around the science. Obviously, all pupils will not be in school all the time, but there's certainly that there's evidence around issues that the R number can be affected by the order, the, the way in which you operate the rotas within your school. And we have a number of rotas where we're seeking to maximise the number, the number of our pupils in school. But again, we, we, we want to be led by, by, by that science. But the, probably one of the biggest issues I would have to say for you in terms of us then bringing the pupils into school is the actual timetabling of them. Because obviously, we set a, a timetable for, for our normal school. But once, once we, we reach the stage where pupils aren't in school all of the time, it isn't really a simple case in a post-primary school of saying, well, for example, we're going to bring in our second form or year nine on two, on two days a week and they'll follow their normal timetable because that may not give them the breadth of experience that they, that they would want to have. And therefore, we're actually going to have to construct 
an additional timetable. And we want to try and do it in a way that allows us to maximise the opportunities for those young people, but equally to, tr to try and make sure that we're in line with whatever guidance we have to follow and in as safe a manner as possible. Now, it's a, a, that timetabling is a complex process, as I'm sure you'd appreciate, and therefore time really is of the essence for us in being able to manage that. Uh, absolutely, Stephen. And, and just, just to touch on, 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 on some of the points there, I understand this isn't a straightforward uh, uh, situation in any way, shape or form. And, and a lot of teachers that I've spoken to, including yourselves, have said it's not so much about class sizes, but about classroom sizes that would accommodate uh, those children on the expected social distancing guidelines of two metres, or even if that mm -hmm. was reduced under consideration. So e even in, in Strabane and Oma, for instance, the largest classrooms in some primary schools couldn't accommodate half the pupils of class no. sizes would cost even at the one metre distance, if, as been discussed in the south of this island. So there's considerable issues there. And also teachers have expressed that budgets are under extreme pressure. So how can a school, for instance, prepare uh, for the necessary measures to be put in place without an extra pound or penny in their budget to resource the school in terms of staff, PPE, or other necessary and essential equipment, even cleaners and cleaning equipment? So there's a huge amount, and I know you'll agree, there's a huge amount of questions that really need to be addressed to give confidence not only to our teaching workforce out there and our principals, but also to the parents of those children who need to be sending their children back to school. Yeah, uh, you know, to, to follow on from that, as, as again, as I say, in schools, uh, principals and governors are, are looking at, 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 the, at the measures that they need to put in place, and there are going to be very significant additional costs, additional costs in, 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 in ensuring that we have the, ha the hand washing facilities that we want, hand sanitising that we want, additional signage around the school, and even in the resources that are available to pupils, because maybe the resources that you were able to share in, in the past, you can't necessarily share them around pupils in the same way that you did previously. And as you, and as you mentioned there, in terms, of, in terms of the budget, our budgets are, as, as, you, as you know, are already stretched beyond breaking point. So trying to find the money to do all that is going to be challenging, but it's certainly something that we want to do because we do want to make sure that when our young people come in that they believe that we have done everything we can to make it safe and their parents believe that and our staff believe that. So we'll have to, we'll have to, t to try and see how we can work our resources around that, but it is going to be very, very challenging. Yeah, even something as simple as children travelling to school and school transport, do they put someone on the bus to keep children apart? So every aspect from that child leaves their house or home in the morning till they get home in the evening needs to be considered, and that is the difficulty for principals because they're concerned not just about the pupils in the school, but when they're travelling to school and what measures EA, for instance, will put in place in that regard. And also uh, in terms of sharing, like the very culture of a school has been about sharing and, uh, with each other, and, and that, that has all been challenged now because the teacher said, don't share that. So there, there's, there's big issues there and challenges ahead. But just to finish on a point, Chair, and thank you for your indulgence here. Yep. Uh, uh, how would you propose, uh, Stephen and Trevor, that DE and SIA go about slimming down the curriculum for GCSE and A-level next year? Will the same process work for every subject? And I know this is a big challenge as well, uh, and it's something that's great concern to a lot of uh, teachers out there. That is, a, I mean, that obviously is a, a significant concern for us, and we know that does vary from subject to subject. Um, Stephen's a mathematician, I am a modern linguist, and I know that in a subject like modern languages, it is going to be extremely difficult to do that. Um, but I do think that, that, that SIA will have to look very carefully at uh, things like controlled assessments, uh, at, at coursework, and so on. Um, now, there, there will be arguments, and even within our membership, I imagine there will be arguments for and against the inclusion or the exclusion of those. Um, but we're going to be, as Stephen has said, we're going to be under extreme time pressure uh, to prepare these young people next year for their GCSEs, ASs and their, and their A2s. And it will be really important that uh, we, we have the pupils in school. I mean, we're going to have to take decisions uh, like not have extracurricular activities. So pupils will be going out and doing all those enriching things. It will be very much geared to preparing them uh, for these very important life-changing uh, career changing um, examinations. So it will be, it, it will be important that see a look at the individual um, subjects. I, I mean, we could look, they could look at a range of uh, things such as perhaps um, a, a paper that would allow schools to choose which parts of the specification that they do um, through, uh, you know, either, you know, answer question A 
B, C or D. Um, I, but what would be dangerous, I think, at this stage would be they just cut out things wholesale because we've got schools that are in different places uh, with, their, with the study of the specification and they may not follow the specification chronologically um, as it's written down and may actually have already covered the material um, with, uh, you know, with their pupils. So, uh, yes, I mean, there is, there is a big discussion to be had. Um, I, uh, well, I am aware that they have been working on this and we look forward to being appraised of their progress. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thank Daniel. You, Robbie Butler. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Trevor and Stephen. Uh, very often we'll, we'll come on here and we'll, 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 we'll thank all of the teachers, but you guys are at the, the front face in, in two excellent schools. So thank you for what you're doing in your leadership and uh, on behalf of ASCL as well. So thank you for your service. And uh, like all of the members have said, we know that our teachers are, are doing a magnificent job at the moment, but faced with unprecedented pressures, I noted, Stephen, that you had commented positively on the Minister's availability and his, um, uh, his, 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 his desire to be front and centre, and I actually would echo that, I think. Well, I wouldn't agree with everything that he's done so far. I think he, he, he has, has set a pretty straight path in difficult circumstances. Guys, um, out of what you've shared today, and it's been comprehensive, it's been relatively easy to understand, and I say relatively because I, I just looked maybe for yourself, Trevor, you talked about the cohort variations. And I think I understand that, and I'd just like a wee bit more clarity in around that, because I, I, we're in a period now where, where, unfortunately, people wait for the Belfast Telegraph every year. They're looking to see the performance tables. I can see locally in Lisburn where different schools bounce around, even on maybe a, a one, two, three, or four yearly uh, basis. And unfortunately, we're, we're measuring schools unfairly, I think, on those. And I, I'm assuming that's what we're really talking about. Uh, what what, they're, what what the uh, CEA are going to do with regard to those that historical data, um, and then just one other thing then is the appeals process. I've raised this um, with the minister and with uh, CCA with regard to the appeals process. I think it's it's an imperfect process, possibly as good as can be, but we definitely need that confidence. I, I don't like I don't like the thought of what you've actually shared, but where if, if uh, an individual pupil. Uh, is it successful in their appeal and it could affect every other pupil in that list at that location. I think that's, that's dreadful. Um, and if, if you could just speak to those two things, I would appreciate it. Well, I have to say, Robbie, from your uh, summation there, you clearly have a very clear um, grasp uh, of what I was talking about. So thank you for that. Um, certainly, it, we are exercised in relation to both of those issues. Um, the cohort variation is just to ensure that teacher professional judgment is not overridden by a computer that just uh, by a computer program that says no. We need to have something. Okay, it can be mathematically sophisticated, but we also need something that's going to be more sophisticated in a way that's going to take account of individual pupils and individual cohorts from year to year. I mean, in any school, if you look over three years, if you look over the past three years, if you if you if you take this to its logical conclusion. And if you applied a, uh, a mathematical program to this, we could all pack up and go home now as regards um, these results. Uh, because SIA could apply its mathematical program to, to a single rank order for the whole school and just give us the grades based on what we've always got over the past three years. Now, yep. that, that would be wrong. That, that, for that to happen, that would be wrong and it would not be taking cognizance of the individual pupils and this individual cohort. So the challenge for SIA will be, will be to find some way of taking this into account, that, that there will be schools who will have in 2020 stronger cohorts at GCSE or AS or A2 and how they're going to um, deal with that uh, in a way that allows the minister uh, to carry out his aspiration and as a commitment to ensure that the, that the results that the young people will get will be fair. In relation to your second point, absolutely, um, it, it, is, it, it is totally unacceptable that any pupil's result could be changed as a result. Now, there is a, a, a technical way of ensuring that this wouldn't happen, whereby if a, if, if a pupil's uh, result goes, say, from a C to a B, that they would be placed at the bottom of the Bs, so that their B would not inter interfere with any other Bs turning their Bs into Cs. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that, that certainly does, and, and thank you for the clarification. Can I just go, uh, Charles, the last question, just go slightly off-piste here. Go ahead. Um, uh, so, 
most people will know that sort of uh, mental health and well-being and, and tackling that, 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 that real scourge that we have in Northern Ireland, and it is, and, and many times, and the chair will agree because he's heard it many times, when, young, when we talk to young people, it seems to be very much uh, probably their number one concern, and the, and the department is drawing up at the moment the uh, emotional, mental, uh, emotional well-being framework for, I think, due to be completed by uh, December. Um, in terms of that, could I just ask, I'm not looking really an answer other than to put it on your radar uh, from your body's perspective to see that as a real priority as well, and I'm sure it is, but just to ensure that it's there because they're, I'm not catastrophizing what's going on at the moment. Our young people are resilient and I don't want to talk them into a corner, but it's just that, that from face and cognizant view of some pupils will have went through unusual difficulties over this, this period and it will perhaps have exacerbated and problems that existed previously and that, that you guys would be speaking to your members and just making sure that it's, it's, it's high up the, the, the priority order, if that's okay. But could I assure you it is high up our priority. I was just having a, a conversation yesterday um, with folks who would help us out with counselling and so on, just to ensure that come August, come September, that we have the capacity um, in school and also working with, out, with, with organisations outside to be able to deal with these young people. One, one thing I will say is uh, young people are generally very resilient and probably significantly more resilient than our adult population gives them credit for. But we cannot assume that that resilience is everywhere and we have a significant number of young people across all of our schools and across all school types who will require help um, and support and we will certainly be doing everything. Mental health is a big issue. It's a big issue for staff, it's a big issue for young people, it's a big issue for society um, at, at large. And I certainly would like to assure the committee that, uh, that our members will be doing everything possible to ensure that we have the capacity uh, as far as possible to deal with the issues that young people are going to be coming along. Because we're going to, we will have young people coming along who will, who will actually probably, some of whom will actually quite have enjoyed that new normal, uh, the, the, the distance learning, will have enjoyed the independence that that brings and so on. And, and, and that's grand. But there will be others. There will be others for whom this has been very difficult. My, my feeling is probably mental health issues that were there uh, pre-COVID-19 have been compounded uh, yes. by what has happened. And as a result of that, then we will do everything on our part to address the issues you've raised. Outstanding. Thank you very much, Trevor. And thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Catherine Kelly? Thank you. thank you, Chair, and thanks so much, Stephen and Trevor, for your briefing. It was very informative, and, and like the other members, I agree with all the points you've made, especially the fact that we need urgent answers to ensure planning can begin. Um, I have one question, and it's in relation to teachers. Um, do you believe the proposed appeals process offers sufficient protection for teachers? Stephen, do you want to? Yeah, well, I think that there, you know, I, I think again, you, you'll be aware probably of, of what has happened in, in, in the south of Ireland as well, and, and that what we have, what we saw there initially was that the teachers had indicated that they were not going to take part in the grading process until they got the proper indemnity, and that that proper indemnity had, had, had been sought for them, and it's now been agreed, and the process is taking place. Now, as, as we understand that that indemnity now is in place for our staff within schools, so, so, that's, so that is certainly there, and we're delighted by that. But I think as well as that, I think that schools have put in place very detailed procedures around the grading, which would mean that indeed that any member of staff's assessment of a pupil is, is, is not a single assessment. <coughs> uh, it's taken a, a account of a lot of data. It's agreed across the, the, their own subject department, and then indeed that, that data is being analysed by, by each principal as well, and they're, they're looking at it in, in that extent. So, so we do believe that the system in that way do, does allow, do, does, and I say, pr provide protection for the teachers who are produ producing the, grade, the, the centre assessed grades. Albeit that, you know, as Trevor has said there, I think probably maybe one of the greater concerns about, for, from the teacher's point of view is that some of those centre-assessed grades which reflect their teacher professional judgement might end up being changed as a result of a statistical model, and I think that's a big concern for them. Yeah. Thanks for that, Stephen. That, that's me, Chair. Thanks, Catherine. Justin McNulty? Justin, are you on mute, maybe? Sorry, guys, just one meeting. No problem, um, thanks. 
Um, guys, thanks very much, Trevor and Stephen, for your presentation. Um, and my head's in a spin, and um, I'm just really worried about the state of mind for both teachers, pupils, for all teachers, pupils, and parents in terms of way forward and the impact um, in relation to mental health. And you've already stated that the, the mental health issues that are that there are currently are going to be compounded, so that's, that's a real concern. Um, th there are a number of schools who have already um, agreed to um, postpone transfer tests this year, and that's I think that's a, a positive move, especially it's in my own constituency. Um, I think that's, that's with the community in mind, it, it's, a, it's a positive move. How sensible do you think that it is that there could be transfer tests in some locations and not in others? Um, uh, obviously, I'm sorry, I have to repeat myself. Um, but but we we are an organisation that, that are drawn from all school types. Um, I mean, I'm principal of a 14 to 19 school. Uh, it doesn't select at 11. Stephen is a school uh, that, 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 that that does select at 11. We have others who partially select at 11 and a, a significant number of schools who don't select at all. And really, um, given that we are, we're here representing a very broad church, I, I really do not feel, and, and, and it's with the greatest respect that I say this, but I really do not feel it would be helpful or appropriate for us to make any comment whatsoever in relation to the transfer test. Okay, understood. Um, thank you for your presentation, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Justin. Uh, Morris? You on mute, Morris? Can you hear us okay? Can you hear me, sir? That's you. Go ahead, Morris. Thanks. I'd like to thank Trevor and Stephen for their presentation. It was very comprehensive, and the answers so far have been very comprehensive. I, I have only one issue that hasn't been covered already, and that's the uh, when the when the kids go back to school. Obviously, the class class sizes is going to be a problem. Uh, do you envisage some of the children attending school? In the, in the in the morning and some in the afternoon coupled with uh, external learning or do you envisage pupils attending school maybe two days a week three days a week and then external learning yeah well i, I i'm happy to, I, i'm happy to, to to take that one you know f f from our point of view and, and say to you that i think you know from our, from and we're we're obviously here, and we're an association that represents post-primary schools, and we wouldn't want to, want to judge what would happen in, in the primary sector. But I think that the talking to colleagues who have who have obviously been planning ahead for this, I do think that the provision is more likely to be a whole day provision for whatever for whatever year groups we bring in. And I think even going back to questions that we were asked earlier around costing, I think that in terms of, of, of the cost of cleaning and so on, I think it's important that we would that we would do that. I, I, I think in terms of where we are, in terms of the, of the access that pupils would get, it is so dependent on, on the social distancing measures. But I think what we would be what we would be looking to try to do would be bring in our our senior year groups if we could for maybe a bit more than 50% of the time, and our junior year groups for maybe a bit less than that. But obviously, we, 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 that's why we need the clarity so that we can plan towards. What, what that programme would look like, and, and to allow parents then as well, who may have childcare arrangements and so on, to be able to think about what days that, that their sons or daughters are going to be in school. But it is so dependent on, 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 on getting clarity and being able to plan forward. Yeah, thank you very much for that, and, and I do agree. And the other thing that you had mentioned there was the trimming down of the curriculum. I do think it's important that all non-essential uh, activities are trimmed from the curriculum to concentrate on the uh, skill sets to take the children forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Morris. Uh, just in closing, then, can I ask, the, the Minister has obviously um, established uh, the Education Restart Programme um, for the, the phased return to school. Uh, he's established an Education Restart Programme Board, which is made up of the Department of Education, the Education Authority, CCMS and SIA. Uh, he is to establish, I believe, an uh, Education Restart Stakeholder Forum, and an education, which will be unions and sectoral bodies, and an Education Restart Practitioners Group, which I think is principals. Um, are, are you 
content uh, with that approach to education restart in terms of engagement? <coughs> I'll make a, a brief comment and, I'll, and then I'll, I'll ask Stephen to, to comment. Um, in, in terms of principles, yes, uh, I am in agreement um, with the programme. Where my concern is, it's timing. Um, we understand from some of the communications that some of this information will not be available to us until late June, uh, or perhaps even into July. Um, that would not be helpful in any shape or form, and we really do need this to be um, kick-started uh, as well as restarted, um, and actually get it going as, as quickly as possible. Um, and maybe it could mean... It, you know, having to up the number of meetings in a particular week, but the sooner, the sooner we get this information, the better. I think Stephen alluded to mid June, and that would be at the very latest where we need to have guidance. Yeah, that, that, I was going to. Sorry, Trevor. I was, I, oh, sorry, I was sorry. Gonna, yeah, no, thank you for that answer. I was going to move to to timing because, uh, uh, if that's if there's contentment with the framework, that's one thing. But as you importantly add, it's the. Um, effectiveness and speed with which yeah. that um, approach is delivered and it's my understanding that the, the practitioners group for example has yet to be established or meet and indeed I was going to ask you about the minister's um, timing time scale and, and I quote from his letter to schools he says that his aim is this work would be progressed during the remainder of this term yeah. which as you say extends to the end of June. Now, that aim is obviously at odds with um, your assertion that this has to be delivered on by mid-June. Would you like to say any more in relation to that? Maybe I'll let, let Stephen say something. Yeah, yeah I, I think Tre Trevor, Trevor su summed it up uh, initially there by saying about, about we need the information earlier, and, and, and really mid-June is, is the very latest that we, we could quantify and deal with some of that information because, as I mentioned earlier, there are real complexities in devising a timetable in a post-primary post school. And the normal time, we, we can't just ad adapt the normal timetable and hope that that will work for, for the young people. We've already heard, and, and I know Morris there alluded to it as well, he said about we need to focus on certain skills, we need to make sure that we're making best use of the teacher time. We can only do that by having the time available to plan the timetable to make that work. So for us, we, we support the, the, the issues that are being raised by the Minister, we support the direction in which it's going, but we really need to see a greater pace to it in terms of us being actually able to deliver it on the ground in late August and September for our young people. Yeah. And, and just maybe just to add to that as well, our schools, our school buildings, some of our school buildings may have closed, our schools have never closed. Our, I mean, schools are the young people and the staff interact with each other. And staff have been working extremely hard. And I can tell you from my own personal experience within my own school, but also knowing as president of this association, talking to all of our members, our teachers are working extremely hard, particularly with those pupils of those key years, years 11 going into year 12 next year, year 13 going into year 14 next year. And they are, I can tell you, exhausted from what they're doing. I mean, sitting, in your, uh, sitting at home in your own bedroom or in your own uh, living room or wherever it is, doing a video conferencing uh, session with a group of pupils is extremely demanding, probably even more demanding than standing in front of a class would be. And they've been working extremely hard. And when they get to the end of June, in order for them to be in a fit place and in a right place, to be able to deal with all the academic and the pastoral and the mental issues that, are, that we're going to be presented with at the end of the, at, at the, end of the summer, uh, it is important, vitally, crucially important, that those people get sufficient rest. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your presentation this morning. Uh, I echo all members um, with regards to uh, the comprehensive nature of it, and the committee has taken every opportunity that we have had to recognise the hard work, dedication and innovation of our teachers and non-teaching staff right across our community at this time. So we do so again today. Um, we thank you for the, the leadership and the support that you're providing to our education sector. And we look forward with, uh, to ongoing engagement with you on these issues and to put in the issues that you've raised today to SIA and to the department to try and get that timely guidance that you need.
to plan for that phased return to school for our children and young people in September. Lovely. Well, just on behalf of the association again, as Stephen said, thank you so much indeed for for inviting us. Um, it is it, it is brilliant that we've had an opportunity to share um, our concerns with you. Thank you for all the work um, that you're doing. We, we 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 very much appreciate your support now in trying to address these issues um, that we have raised. Um, it it uh, we do speak on behalf of our members, but we are driven by doing what we possibly can for our young people. And Stephen, would you like, would you like to say something again? No, ju- just, just to echo that again, uh, you know, f- and on behalf of, of behalf of us all, we're, we, we have been delighted to be invited here today. We've been, been very encouraged by, by the liaison we've had with politicians throughout this, and indeed w- with, all, with all the organisations. I think all of us are passionate about young people. We're passionate about giving the young people in our country the best opportunity. And I think everything that we're saying here is, is geared towards that. We want to make sure that when we get our children back into school that they have the confidence to come back and to be able, and, and, and to, be able to enjoy school as, as they have done before and also that the things that are in place now for the qualifications make sure that they do leave with the qualifications which they deserve and I think those are the points that certainly from our point of view are, are really important to stress. Okay, right. thank you gentlemen. Okay, thank you. Thank thanks, you. Thanks very much, well the best. Bye thanks, bye. 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 Okay, members, thanks for your your questions and your cooperation for that evidence session. Our next agenda item then um, flows well into our evidence session with uh, the Council for the Curriculum Examinations and Assessment Oral Briefing. Uh, Can I just check that uh, we have uh, our SIA officials with us on the line? Justin, Sharon, Trevor? Yes, firm. Yes, gentlemen. Yep, that's great. Okay, then can I refer members to... Uh, a covering note from the clerk at page 74 for this session. I uh, see a paper on feedback from the consultation on examination appeals at page 79. A copy of the Minister's related statement to the COVID-19 ad hoc committee at page 104. And previous related SIA correspondence on examination contingency arrangements at page 120. I'm delighted to welcome Justin Edwards, Chief Executive for the Council for the Curriculum Examinations and Assessment, Ms Sharon King, Head of Regulation at SIA, and Mr Trevor Carson, Chairperson uh, of SIA. By way of welcome, uh, can I remind us that SIA briefed the committee in April on the way forward for GCSE and A-levels owing to the COVID-19 lockdown. At the time, the committee was advised that there would be a consultation on a revised examination appeals process. That con- consultation has recently concluded, and SIA kindly agreed to share the findings of this consultation and give an indication of the way forward. Our committee will then be uh, required promptly to set out our views, which SIA will take into consideration before making its final recommendations to the Minister on this matter. Can I invite then our CA officials to make an opening statement and to take questions from members? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thanks for the invitation. This is Trevor Carson. I'm Chairman of Council uh, and have been for this past seven and a half years. Uh, as Chair of CA Council, first I'd like to introduce my two colleagues, Justin, obviously Chief Executive, and Sharon King, who's Head of Regulation. Uh, I'd like to outline the Council's role since the beginning of these exceptional circumstances that we find ourselves in. Schools closed, exam series cancelled. Uh, and just to reassure the committee that from the start, uh, I personally had daily briefings from the Chief Executive, and it very quickly became clear that Council involvement uh, was going to be critical in this. Uh, Justin and his team have responded incredibly to the unfolding challenges, and there have been many. And we decided uh, very, very quickly that there should be weekly briefings for Council. This has allowed Council's experience and expertise to be added to the decision-making process. Papers on the range of issues presenting ensured that good governance arrangements were adhered to. And I hope that that also provides reassurance for Justin and his team. Before I hand over to Justin and Sharon, I would like as Chair and on behalf of Council to highlight the effort that has been put in by all of the staff in the SEA 
organisation. And finally, to underline, uh, as Council have made decisions over this past number of weeks, at the core of these decisions, what was in the best interest of all young people uh, that are affected by this, and to be as fair and as equitable as possible to all of this year's cohort. That was our guiding principle. I'll hand over now to Justin, who can give you the detail in relation to the consultation on the appeals procedure. And just to point out that over this past seven and a half years, I in fact have chaired a number of the appeals panels uh, that have uh, come across CA's desks. So Justin, over to you. Thank you, Trevor, and uh, good morning, um, members of the committee, and thank you for this opportunity to come back and uh, present to you the outcome of the appeals consultation. Uh, could I start and just um, uh, join up with the ASCO uh, position of thanks for the scrutiny of this committee. Um, we did present to this committee in April, as the chairman outlined, um, the view of the model of the way that we would progress in regards to the award of qualifications for this summer in these very difficult and unprecedented circumstances. And as part of that, we did outline that we would go to consultation on the appeals component of this process. And today I'm able to present back to you um, the appeals factor. I know from the previous presentation that members may also have questions about the next uh, year, academics year um, qualifications and examinations, but I think it would be important not to conflate the two issues. Uh, what we are doing for arrangements for this year versus what might be done for the next uh, academic year as not to confuse uh, young people who are currently anticipating their exam results in August. Uh, as I outlined before to this committee in April, it's an unprecedented situation. There is no um, historical context of when examinations were last cancelled. And uh, we've always said that examinations were the best form uh, of making educational judgment uh, and the assessment arrangements that this is no longer available to us. And the appeals process was historically in a normal situation, very much based on um, appeals or challenges to the examination process. So without the examination process being available, being unavailable to us, and a new model means that we have to go back and consider uh, where we sit in regards to the uh, appeals process for this summer's outcome. We did launch a survey. We have worked in conjunction um, with regulators both in England and Wales. Uh, we have a shared brand. The GCSE brand and the A-level brand is shared across three jurisdictions of England and Wales. And so it's in our, all our interests to maintain similarity uh, where we can in approach. However, there are jurisdictional differences on examination policy as set by the ministers of those jurisdictions. And we have to take that into account as well uh, when we're considering how we would approach the appeals process. We've also worked with awarding organisations uh, across uh, um, these jurisdictions as well. Uh, we've worked with uh, AQA, OCR, Pearson and WJC, who all offer GCSE and A-level qualifications. And in fact, um, quite a few students in Northern Ireland will take A-level qualifications uh, and a few will take GCSE qualifications with those awarding organisations here and we'll be waiting for results from them this summer as well. So a, a common approach, uh, England and Wales have concluded their consultation, and now we have concluded ours. The consultation was open from the 7th of May to the 21st of May, and I recognise that that was a very short period consultation. But given the time constraints um, and the urgency of meeting the issue of results state, uh, which was a, a primacy in making sure that we could get results for learners so that they could progress to their next uh, next part of their educational journey, uh, we felt that there was a necessity to progress with this at that pace so that we could get uh, answers to yourselves today, to the public, and to allow the awarding organisations time to adapt uh, their internal processes. In response to the consultation, we had 753 um, online survey responses. Uh, we provided the online survey as an appendix to members which allowed uh, a Likert scale response, um, a, agree or disagree on a five-point scale, but also allowed opportunity for um, people to provide free response to each of the proposals that we set out. In those 753 responses, 88% were individual, and a large quantity of those were parents or young people. 11% were organizations, um, 
teaching representative bodies, um, headmaster representative, um, headmistress representative bodies, uh, etc., provided that. But we also had representation from higher education uh, quarters and government departments. Six respondents uh, chose not to use the online survey. Um, they provided a email uh, response in free submission, and we did take those into account when we considered um, uh, our response, uh, our, our um, approach to the proposals. So in the analysis of the response, um, there were a, a significant number of our proposals that were supported by the uh, majority. And um, these are that uh, we should allow centres to appeal to see a ward and organisation on administrative process. That was, that was supported by the majority in the consultation. That is that centres could appeal to see a where there's a technical or administrative issue in terms of the um, centre assessed grades, um, or the approach on the information that was being provided, uh, and that would be normal uh, as well within inside our current process. Uh, we've also uh, had a majority response from making it a regulatory requirement that the award and organisation obtains, um, there's no requirement for the organisation to obtain the consent of a candidate whose results may be impacted by the appeal but did not initiate it. We've also taken the third one that allow the award and organisation personnel who were involved in the original statistical model to be involved in the review of an appeal. This, this approach that we've had to introduce this summer uh, relies uh, heavily on statistic and statistical information. And normally uh, we would separate out those responsible for the statistical model from the appeals process. But given that there is so much statistics involved in this, we felt it important that we still allow statisticians to be involved in the review of the appeals, particularly those on the administrative process. Um, we have had a majority response um, accepting our proposal to run a different from normal appeals process. So as I outlined before, the arrangements that we're having to put in place this summer are much different um, because the examinations aren't available and so we do need a different appeals process and the majority of people have accepted that. And also to allow uh, regulatory exam procedure review services, which is the regulatory review service EPRS that operates across um, the jurisdictions between the regulatory authorities to remain and operate. And again, the majority of respondents uh, agreed with that proposal. So I would move on then to um, the proposals that we had where we didn't have a majority response or that the majority response was very uh, close in, in balance. The first one, um, we had proposed that um, effectively that centres should represent students through the appeals process. Now, when a, in a normal year, uh, in previous years, any appeals would be normally represented by the centre. The candidate or pupil or student would approach the, um, the body, the school usually, uh, in that case, would approach the body and would ask that body to make representation to the likes of CR or AQA or OCR. And we had on this 54% um, disagreeing. And in those disagreeing, it was on the basis usually of individual response, um, students or candidates um, who felt that their interests may not be represented by centres. Now, centres usually have, a, well, do have a very good understanding of the context of the student. They have a very good understanding of the complex nature of the examinations process and therefore are able to represent the candidate's interest. However, there is a, a point that candidates may raise where they have asked the centre to take forward an appeal and an appeal um, by the centre is not, not deemed uh, necessary um, and where does the opportunity lie for candidates to challenge that and that was where a lot of the disagreement, uh, where there was a, 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 an imbalance in that, where the disagreement was coming from. If you look at the normal process that would operate in previous years, if a candidate was dissatisfied with the centre's approach, they would normally follow the complaints process or the complaints procedure with that centre, that school or that college. And that centre or school or college will have a policy in place in order to support uh, a complaint and walk through uh, a complaint with an individual candidate on their behalf. Only if that complaint is not upheld are there uh, particular challenges where an independent investigation might apply. 
So there are normal arrangements in place to deal with the issues of individuals uh, wishing to understand why centres aren't able to represent them and aren't able to proceed with that through a complaints process. And on that basis, and given that there were no other options um, in play, we are still of the view that the normal process does apply. We don't have to change it. And actually, uh, centres in the vast majority of cases should still continue to represent the individuals. The, the second issue is um, that allowing candidates who may be impacted by the appeal of a different candidate to have their rank order changed. The rank order, um, let's say a, a student candidate A uh, appeals uh, their position, um, both in terms of rank order or grade or outcome, um, and on that basis are successful, um, they will potentially change rank order. And in doing so, they will cause challenges in terms of a rank order of another student, student B, who didn't originally appeal. And in our proposal, we said that that should that should be the case, that student B should have their rank order or their position changed. And the vast majority of candidates, 74%, came back and disagreed with that proposal. And actually, that candidate B shouldn't have their appeal outcome changed on that basis. And given that level of disagreement uh, with that, we've reviewed that, and we've proposed that we should not apply that um, so that candidate A can have their rank order changed, but candidate B will remain in position. And listening to the presentation from um, Askell this morning to the committee, uh, I know that they are also of that view um, in terms of sustaining the rank order of candidate B who didn't appeal. So we will change or adopt a new proposal there not to change that. The other one was um, an appeal on the basis of the statistical model to be used. And there are uh, particular challenges in regard to using um, appeals that would, would lead to challenges on the statistical model. The statistical process acts in conjunction with the center of test grade and the teacher professional judgment. It doesn't act as a, a separate component part. And for this approach to be maintained effectively, the model must be applied consistently. To have application of the model down to an individual basis or a sender basis on the basis of an appeal, where individual or sender basis introduces data which is not part of the original model, then it stands that that might compromise or will actually compromise the fairness and consistency across the whole cohort. In that case, then, the direction of uh, using a standard model uh, with teacher judgment would start to collapse because you wouldn't have fairness across the consistency. There are also issues about what data would be acceptable with inside that model outside the data that we agree to use for all students. Um, and that is one of the challenges that all regulators would face in considering um, appeals on that basis. So our position remains that uh, appeals process should not consider an appeal against the um, statistical model, but I know that the committee will want to have a better understanding of how the models might work um, across the different qualification types. We've also um, had to consider the fact of teacher professional judgment and whether teacher professional judgment could be challenged through the appeals process. And teacher professional judgment are the centre assessed grades and the rank orders that are currently being provided by our schools. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank all the professionals out there who have been supplying this information to us. Uh, to date, this morning, we've had over 80% of the A-level uh, grades submitted, which shows that schools and colleges are really engaging in this detailed process, and they're engaging with um, absolute professionals. And I, I thank them all for their hard work in helping us through this. There is a, a balance, a very close balance of margin in favour of protecting the teacher's professional judgment. 45.4% uh, were in favour of protecting the teacher's judgment. 45.1% wished the teacher's judgment to be challenged through the appeals process. I think that in regards to the teacher's judgment, given the situation that the teachers are in, we have to protect their judgment from influence or bias so that they are able to provide the fairest assessment 
of the student's likely outcome had examinations normally occurred on the evidence that they have available. And even though there is a fine balance um, between the two parties on whether this should continue or not, it's my view that teacher professional judgment should be protected to protect the integrity and fairness of the whole system to all learners who are participating in it at this time. Uh, at that point, Chairman, I'm conscious of time and there will be uh, you, you wish questions um, from members. Um, so I'll leave it and I'm happy to take questions on any of that and any of the further items that were explored this morning. Okay, thanks very much indeed for your, your presentation. I'll, I'll move swiftly into questions uh, and just seek confirmation of one or two um, parts of the briefing. So ju just to confirm then, one of the key concerns in the consultation responses and, and indeed put forward by ASCAL today was um, that uh, an individual pupil grade change should not affect any other pupil's grade. And just to seek your confirmation, you have accepted the argument that indeed that individual grade change should not affect any other pupil's grade? Yes, uh, Chairman. Um, there was a significant majority in, in favour of, of changing that proposal, and we will um, take a change proposal to Council on that basis. Okay, uh, I think that'll be welcomed by many people, and we're grateful for that update. Um, in terms of uh, cohort um, variation, then, um, what guarantees can be provided to ensure that no individual candidate who is assessed by her cent his or her centre will not be disadvantaged um, by not being awarded the grade that he or she deserves uh, reflective of his ability? Um, by any statistical adjustment to bring results in line with previous cohorts? So at, at this point in time, the model, the statistical standardisation model is still being finalised. Um, we have had to develop in an eight-week period an entirely new approach to examination and awarding of grades, um, doing it in conjunction across jurisdictions. And the data set which is now being provided by schools and colleges um, and again, I'm, I'm grateful for all the work that they've done on that. The data set being provided by schools and colleges um, has, has not been provided in this way before. So it, it is new, it is unprecedented. The models um, do vary slightly by the different qualification types. And in our head of centre guidance, which I presented to the committee before in April, um, which was derived from the minister's direction of approach, we outlined how we would approach each qualification type. And we are using um, prior achievement data uh, in a lot of cases. So this is data that reflects already the ability of the candidate who is sitting that examination. And it's being used uh, in order to project uh, a likely outcome. But it is used in combination with the teacher professional judgment and the teacher rank order or the centre rank order in that part. I think that concerns raise in um, how much will the model vary the potential teacher judgment and teacher rank order. But the, the fact is that we need the teacher judgment and the rank orders to understand how that model uh, might, might apply. And the model has to apply consistently across all learners. So it isn't just a model about um, the changes or ad adaptations to one individual, but have to apply across all. In Northern Ireland, because of the policy position in regards to, say, for example, A-levels, we are in a strong position because we have a considerable amount of AS-level data on which to base that. And that AS-level data at a centre level, and noting the concerns from Haskell this morning, represents how that centre is doing across subjects um, and also represents how the individuals were progressing within inside that centre when we come to standardisation. I think that the balance of um, that model doesn't take primacy over the fact that we are using that teacher professional judgement because teachers also have a vast range of other information about how learners might have, ha might have uh, performed had the examinations gone ahead. So I, I think that it would be important also, um, noting some of the, the committee's comments previously and, and, and ASCO's comments previously, that there is an assumption that computers are making changes here. It is not computers 
the computers are merely the tools being used by people. And the people are the teachers, the principals of schools, but also statisticians ensuring that the continuity and fairness across the cohort is still applied and that conflict can be retained within inside our qualification system. Okay. I, I think the concern is that uh, pupils ought to receive their grade on the basis of their 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 own individual performance as opposed to the performance of the centre in which they are being assessed? Yes, the, the, the student is graded as an individual basis. So the grade okay. and rank order they are positioned in is applied to the individual. And the grade that SEER issues to the individual is reflective of that individual's knowledge, understanding, skills and ability. Okay. Can I, in, in connection with that, can I ask, um, would it be sensible and, and will SEER consult schools adequately in advance of pupils receiving grades in order to um, identify any potentially significant errors? Through the, through the process, we won't um, consult on the, the model. We have had direction um, on how to use the model, and we are applying it across regulatory authorities and awarding organisations. I think that uh, we have engaged with some centres um, because they are in unique circumstances. So there are, for example, um, recently merged centres um, who have two cohorts previously merged together. So we have to consider um, some of those factors. So we have taken uh, information in to inform our model, but not just information uh, from Northern Ireland, actually working with both statisticians, educational academics and other regulators across the shared brand of GCSE and GCE. We will have a process in place that will check for errors. Um, so when we take the grades in, we are checking for errors. When we are looking at standardization, we are checking for errors. And we are also using subject-based officers to understand how the individual subjects um, will, will perform as well to ensure that there are no errors occurring there. And as we progress this model, we will constantly monitor and review to see if there are any changes or any unanticipated um, behaviours uh, within inside the standards and, and the outcome so that we can deal with, deal with that data. But I have to say that the, the time frame is very challenging. We have to have these results with these... Please hold. So that... Sorry, can everybody still hear me? Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, that we still have these learners in a position that they can progress to university and we hit that issue of results date so that they have best opportunity to progress to university, college, employment, etc., as we've outlined before. Okay. Um, so really there is, there is a lot of work that is going on to ensure that we are not in any way disadvantaging. We are monitoring that data as it comes in. Okay, I'll be slightly more specific. Is there merit in schools and centres receiving the grades in, you know, days in advance of the pupils in order for that to be a check on any significant errors? In a normal year, we would issue the grade outcomes to a centre in a day in advance anyway. And I would like to think that we can stick to that commitment that that information flows out to senders so they can see that. Again, it just allows them to pick up those administrative errors so that we can, in some cases, informally resolve them as quickly as possible before is, the issue is. Is it worth trying to make that slightly um, earlier than just one day? It, it would be very challenging because okay. as part of that mechanism, we share our data um, between regulators and awarding organisations to ensure standards, standards and consistency um, wherever possible. There are also risks of um, confidentiality of early release of data and therefore potentially securing, for example, other places, uh, etc. <laughs> so we have to, we have to finalise and get results uh, to UCAS simultaneously. It would be challenging to bring it forward from that day, given everything else that we're trying to manage at the moment. Okay. Chair, can I come in there, please? Uh, sorry, who's that? Daniel. Daniel, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry to the other members, but I'm sitting here with my... Uh, head in my hands, and I can only imagine that any principal or teacher across Northern Ireland listening to this will be doing the same, if not thumping the table with frustration. Do you realise, Justin, that we are chatting about children here? Chatting with young people. And you're talking continually about consistency. 
with an English model that is not re- relevant to Northern Ireland, particularly around the GCSE situation, and particularly in this model that you haven't even designed yet, that you're so reliant on and ready to die in the ditch for. I, I can't understand this one, one, one inch. Like, in terms of the, the GCSE information, England have information in relation to attainment around GCSEs. Northern Ireland don't. So how is this model going to be consistent, to use your own word? How is it going to be reflective of the reality here? And how is it going to be fair? I, 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 I could see, see every principal in the country going, what is this man chatting about? He's not listening to teachers. I think you need to listen to teachers. And I really have a question here, Justin, and I don't mean to be in any way offensive or overly blunt. But do you trust teachers at all with their own judgment? They're the people that's on the ground at the cold face that's dealing with these pupils and these children every single day. I'm sitting listening here and I am going, what on earth are you chatting about? Okay, this is John, not okay Justin. Back to the reality. Yeah, Justin. And I'm sorry for being blunt there, Chair. No, but that's... We're chatting with children here. Yeah, yep, you've asked the question. Justin? I think that uh, in regards to children, uh, throughout all the operation, um, both in here and broader and even at a personal level, um, I'm completely aware that every grade to every individual child matters. Um, and actually ensuring absolute accuracy of that grade, um, that that grade is a fair and accurate representation of the individual child's ability, knowledge, skills, understanding that they've developed over time. I'm fully conscious um, of the role of my organization uh, and myself um, and how that represents back to the individual. I think that in terms of the point of trust in teachers, uh, there is a high degree of trust in the teaching profession on this process. And the engagement, as was pointed out by ASCO this morning, with both professional bodies uh, and individuals and supporting teachers, yes, it's complex, yes, it's very different, yes, it's very unprecedented. But we have had um, overwhelming support in terms of the return of the information, the processes that schools are applying to make sure that that has a high standard. And that information is a fundamental and core part to the decisions that we are making at this point. It is not being rejected, overwritten, (laughs) ruled out. It is central to making this process work. And frankly, it could not be done without the support of teachers. Well, well, just now I can tell you, to use your own terms there, overwritten, ruled out is exactly how teachers are, are feeling in relation to this. You, you keep reflecting on this model that doesn't even exist yet. I don't know how you can guarantee that it's going to deliver any of the things that you're promising, uh, given that it hasn't even been designed yet, nor tested either, which is going to be a significant issue. You know, teachers and principals, I don't know which one is the which, which of them you're speaking to, but I can tell you the ones I'm speaking to on a weekly basis uh, are telling me uh, very different to, than what you're reflecting today and are very concerned that you are not listening to the teachers at the cold face. Okay, uh, Daniel, I'm going to bring uh, another member in at this point and um, try and come back to you as well if we have time, but uh, bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Justin, Sharon and Trevor for attending this morning. Um, I also want to uh, send our thanks to the, the staff at the we are working very hard at this present time and will continue to do so over the summer. Um, uh, as we hear there, there is so much to get through. Um, uh, I suppose, like, listen, um, there's, there's a lot of still unanswered questions as we go forward in this. But I'm very concerned around the use of school profiling and the statistical calculation process and how that will magnify acceptance, inequality and disadvantage. Um, you know, what have you considered in ways of supporting children from a disadvantaged background and those private individual, individuals as well to ensure that they won't be unfairly disadvantaged by these new arrangements? Thank you very much for your question. Um, in terms of uh, testing the model, and the model is in its final stages, um, it's just being reviewed currently by regulatory statistical colleagues, so I wouldn't want to give the view that a considerable amount of work hasn't been completed in terms of the model. Um, The model does follow through prior achievement data. Um, It does provide information that the candidates have already, uh, it does rely on candidates already, achievement that's already within inside the system. 
and so it reflects already their ability and their capability. If you add that um, with the teacher professional judgment, I come back, the teachers understand the abilities of that individual student on the basis of the evidence and the information that they have. And that information will seek to ensure that each individual's skills and abilities are represented through into the final grade. And I think on that basis, that um, eliminates or certainly reduces to as much a degree as is possible any likelihood of advantage or disadvantage in the grade outcomes that would be applied. And I think it, it go back to the point that teacher professional judgment still is a core and critical part of this process. And that it's that teacher that's making sure that the students that they face aren't disadvantaged, not just at an individual level, at a school level, at a cohort level when they're providing that data through. Well, um, it's just the difficult circumstances that we're left in, Justin, but particularly we would know, you know, at the end of the last term, a lot of those students would, you know, would be extra support would be provided and things would be put in place to, to help them get, you know, to that final stage. I'm just re really concerned that we didn't have the time to do that. There's no mechanism to take this on the account. Speaking to some parents who have their children at home, they're very concerned children who had been home before COVID and they had been uh, teaching them young people in, in our settings, just that, you know, they're, they are going to be most disadvantaged. I thank you for, the, you know, the update that you've given, but I do believe that there needs to be, uh, you know, special consideration uh, looked at for them. Um, and just on, um, I know you were saying we're not going to talk about today here. You don't, you, you don't want to look at, you know, uh, conflict with the curriculum for next year but you know um just all of this highlights uh the difficulties and uh, for next year and we heard from askel this morning last week i had raised it with officials in relation to looking at the content of the curriculum next year um, and i feel that it's very very important that we start that work early everyone's involved as daniel has said principals uh, and, and others um, from the beginning to co-design and, and work on this uh, and, and not just at the end when it's a consultation and that the clear work starts early and that we get guidance out as soon as possible on that. If, if I could respond, uh, Chairman. Um, yeah, Justin. I, I think for this year, and come back to your point um, around uh, lost teaching or, or lost time or lost support in year, in the guidance that we issued, we asked teachers and schools to provide grades had examinations normally occurred, had they taken place as normal. And in factoring in that consideration, we wanted to factor, them, factor in the, the support that they would have given to individual learners in the run-up to examinations before they provided that grade. So that was very important for this current year. I think at yeah. the point of the next uh, curriculum year, Understanding um, the impact, that there, there are two factors, uh, understanding the impact on learners, and there's, there's starting to emerge some evidence of the impact on learners, but being able to quantify that, to be able to understand that, so that we can factor that into our thinking, but also to start to understand um, in more clarity the health restrictions. Because, as was pointed out by Askel this morning, changes to maybe, for example, assessment arrangements have to be done in conjunction with whatever the health arrangements are. And if the health arrangements are that social distancing still applies in a particular way, or that there are health arrangements in how learners uh, can attend school, that would have a bearing on our thinking on how you might uh, assess learners in that particular context. And so it is, and this is for next year, it is particularly challenging, and I know I fully appreciate it's challenging for school principals and school teachers in planning that out. It is particularly challenging in trying to model through what that new school day looks like and the guidance on that new school day so that we can build assessment arrangements that fit that new school day best. Yeah, thank you, Justin. And just when, the last time you were on a committee, I'd asked about um, consideration for a helpline for parents um, and young people, I know there's a principal's one, 
um, have, have you given further consideration uh, to so that? At, at this time, what we're finding is that the, we have been able to answer queries um, to pupils and parents through various uh, social media channels and also through our inbox. The helpline is to support senders because senders have proven already, and, and since the last time I spoke to you, a best place to support the learners. They're using the materials and information um, that I've been able to provide, or SEA has been able to provide uh, back into the system to then provide guidance to their cohort of learners. The point made by Astro this morning um, is that each school has its own context or variation in timetabling or different approaches to different exam boards. And so ensuring that uh, where that school context is applied is really important. And I think providing a, a separate helpline for pupils and teachers might lead to other information that isn't in the school context. So at this moment in time, I think that the process is working well in supporting those teachers and learners through the centre. Okay, okay that's me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Karen. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, I welcome the delegation this morning, and uh, I apologise, Chair, uh, I had to step out of the meeting for uh, take a telephone call from the police. Um, so if I've missed this uh, fairly simple point, please, please forgive me. No problem. Uh, the, 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 the fact that the uh, nine awarding bodies have signed up off on the joint contingency plan, um, that's the totality of the bodies across the UK. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that. Uh, and does that mean then, Chair, sure, that uh, pupils in GCSEs and A levels uh, and any related appeals, that the criteria that is applied throughout the UK, uh, sorry, will be consistent throughout the UK and used by all the awarding bodies? Justin? Um, right, thank you very much for the, the, the question. Um, there are five awarded bodies that offer GCSE and A-level qualifications, and there are over 100 awarding bodies that offer vocational qualifications. Um, the appeals process I'm discussing today applies to the GCSE and, and A-level qualifications. The point about um, similarity or, or um, the approach, uh, there are variations in examination policy that exists between jurisdictions in the UK. For example, in Northern Ireland, we still have the AS, which contributes towards the A-level, um, and we have modular GCSEs, and that's not the case uh, in England. However, as far as is possible and working together, I think that uh, it's really important that we found similarity and find similarity in approach. And so when we were considering our proposals for the appeals process, or we were considering our proposals around the teacher professional judgment there has been consistency and there will be consistency applied wherever possible when we um, do the issue results and the standards there is another factor that 18 percent of a level uh, sorry 13 percent of a level candidates in northern ireland take awards with non seer uh, so they take it with aqa uh, ocr wjc and pearson and so, again, having consistency uh, between the awarding body approaches is very important. And that's why SEA has been part of the Joint Council for Qualifications, which then provides all the policy and guidance to our schools and our colleges to make sure that that is consistent and there's good understanding as well. So wherever possible, there's a high degree of similarity. But in the policy context, there are some differences. Okay, can I just uh, follow up, Chair? I mean, really what we're saying then is that as best possible we have achieved consistency and that uh, no pupil in Northern Ireland at perhaps A level who wants to attend university in some other part of the UK or indeed uh, in the Republic will be in any way disadvantaged if there is a, an appeal to be undertaken. Uh, apologies, Chair, could I ask that question be repeated? My line just went a bit strange. <laughs> yeah, well, mine went the same to be honest with you. Uh, uh, <laughs> Um, in the, in, based on what you've said around the, the appeals process there, uh, am I right in thinking then that if a student uh, at perhaps A level uh, is interested in a, a position at a university in, in England, Scotland, Wales, or indeed in the Republic, that, that indeed uh, if there is a, an appeal to be undertaken, that, that student wouldn't be in any way disadvantaged against maybe a uh, a, a student in England, Scotland, or Wales. 
Um, the, the, in our view, there would be no disadvantage. We have engaged with the Irish Universities Association and CAO for a north-south transition, and we've engaged with UCAS for uh, transition into England, Welsh and Scottish uh, provision, as well as our own Northern Ireland provision uh, at HE, and we've kept them informed of our models and approaches all the way through. Um, we, we've actually had support um, from those bodies in what we're doing, uh, and we haven't had any indication of, of disadvantage or issue. And if there were, we would move very quickly to resolve it if it existed. Uh, Chair, can I, I thank the members of the panel. That, that seems to me to be an excellent piece of work that's been done in a relatively short period of time and under great pressure. Okay, thanks, Robin. Uh, Daniel, bring you back in for a concise <laughs> question. Yeah, uh, and uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, Justin, uh, apologies for the bluntness of my response earlier, but this is a very uh, frustrating process. Uh, and something that is causing a great amount of concern out there and will continue to. And I still have a, a huge amount of questions, particularly around uh, GCSE and what you're basing your information on, given that you have no prior data. Uh, and and that, that's something I really do want you to answer. But I'm just going to move on to a question that I've, I've jotted down here. Um, you, you, you don't, so, Justin, you don't want an appeal. See, you don't want an appeal against the statistical model. So why are CIA so confident that it is always right in every instance? And surely it should only be a guide to establish a confidence ban. Schools that have clear evidence combined with teacher judgments should have the final say. And I know I touched on that earlier. Are you saying that a school cannot improve results? Because that seems to be the message that's coming across. And I've received two text messages since, we've, since this meeting has started uh, uh, relating to that. Have achievements how, have achievements how statistically relevant is your model to small cohorts of children. And I know that you did not give us the percentage of respondents to the consulta consultation. We disagreed with you on this because I would imagine there's quite a number of people who have disagreed with you on this issue. And will you share that information with us, Justin, please? Yes, um, in regards to your last point, I, I'll, I'll get the actual numbers for you on that particular point. I don't have them um, in front of me right now, but I will get that and share that to the committee. Um, in terms of prior data, we do have uh, prior data. We have um, centre performance data, uh, candidature data at that centre, a subject cohort level. Um, so we are able to use that. Um, in terms of um, the, the performance over time, um, we are considering performance over time. We've asked in the teacher professional judgment and the rank order grades for consideration by that centre of performance over time, and we are considering uh, performance over time in our model as well. Um, so that will be taken into consideration. And in some cases in the model, we actually have prior attainment data at the individual basis on previous achievement, which we're able to carry forward. Um, so all that is in place. The, the, I, I turn back to the idea that we would overrule um, teacher uh, professional judgment just using a standardized model. It's not that case. It is a balance between the teacher professional judgment in combination with the statistical model in order to derive uh, an outcome. The point of the challenge on the statistical model, um, it's, very, it's very difficult to have a standard approach to the point of challenge on the statistical model. Let's say, for example, um, one school uh, provides us with a particular proprietary product, let's say a, a, a test or an instrument that they have, and another school doesn't have that information. If that other school doesn't have that information because they haven't purchased into that product, um, they would be at a disadvantage of arguing the basis of case against the statistical model. Likewise, uh, one school might have taught certain components in a particular way uh, and have data on that, and another school might be approaching a, a new model of those particular components. So again, you wouldn't have consistency of challenge against the central model. So it's not that here is always right. It's just that in inclusion in our model, what we're trying to do is bring the most consistent set of data together for all learners across all schools or colleges um, across the entire cohort, so it's fair to everyone. Yeah, and, and, and thank you for that as well. And r around the data, I think we're going to uh, disagree uh, completely on this because I don't believe that the data held uh, for GCSE is robust enough compared to that held for A-level data, and I think that that is going to continue to be a significant issue, particularly for teachers out there and indeed for parents of those children affected. And also, I don't understand how you can give me an assurance or this committee 
as to how it's going to work for those small cohorts, cohorts because it's not statistically possible to do so uh, and it will be very challenging to do so as well. I think Justin, this uh, model is full of holes and is going to raise considerable difficulty going forward and certainly in terms of confidence in the process as well. I don't think there will be much. Uh, you've said that uh, you can't provide me with the percentage of respondents to the consultation who disagreed. I, I would probably argue that there's a significant amount to disagree, and I do look forward to that figure and you sharing it with us, and I appreciate your offer to do so. I'll finish on this final question, Chair, and, and just... Um, schools pay massive fees to see it for exams. These will not be happening this year. Will schools be receiving a refund uh, uh, whole or in the past? And that's the, the final question. Thanks. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, currently we have um, considered our options in regards to fee charges and we're engaging with the Department of Education uh, for that one. And uh, just in, in regards to that uh, the, the figure, sorry, I didn't have it in front of me, but I've managed to dig it up through the paperwork here now. 64% disagreed uh, with the proposal that this statistical standardization model um, shouldn't be a point of appeal. So it's 64 percent of the 700 and 53 respondents. But you're not you're not changing that further to that 64 percent disagreement. I think that in the, um, the in the analysis of both the open response and the um, and the longer responses that we received, the basis on which you would appeal there was. Uh, no new basis um, on which you would appeal. And as I said before, the, the issue of having a standardised uh, set of information which would be fair across all schools and across all cohorts um, wasn't available to us. And nobody proposed an option where that, above and beyond the data sets that we already have, nobody proposed an option that we could use in that context for, an, for the basis of an appeal, not the basis of an award. Okay. And on Daniel's question in regards to the fees? Um, the fees, as I said, we have our options and we've considered those and we've uh, provided um, options to DE for consideration. Um, there are factors as an arm's length body where we need to have um, consideration by the Department of Education at this point on, on how to approach um, fee charges, but we haven't made a decision on that yet. And could you update us on that, Justin, when you do receive it, please? I will do, yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Robbie Butler? Thank you, Chair. Um, Justin, thank you uh, for that. I'd probably members have covered most of what I was going to ask. Probably just a little bit of clarity, and I think it was in and around the question that the Vice Chair had asked uh, in the first instance. So I would uh, maybe truncate it and just say that um, a lot of pupils, and you sort of did answer it, but maybe just to, to, to bring it out a wee bit further, um, that, that some pupils do peak late uh, in any academic year that they rely on their final exam uh, for their mark um, and, and certain um, traits in personality, shall we say, would lend themselves to that. Um, I, I, we did talk about the extra support that's given to, to young people like that, but I'm not even talking about those people. I'm talking about the students who just does well by finishing well. Um, so does this process um, protect that um, as robustly as it can with regard to those teacher assessments, the professional judgment and the prior attainment data? Is it totally equitable for the, the late strong finisher? Um, yeah, I think this relates back to the um, earlier point in regard to the teacher professional judgment, both the grade and the rank order. Um, in, in respect of the guidance we've given to schools on this, we've clearly outlined that they are to make their judgment on the likely outcome of that individual with inside that individual subject had examinations completed as normal. So we are anticipating with their knowledge, not just of the the data and information, but the knowledge of how the individual um, has performed. And for many students, they'll have uh, five or seven years of schooling and have been working with those teachers for many years, um, how that learner might have performed in normal circumstances. And that will ensure an under, that will ensure that those learners who face or, or are likely to, let, let's call it what it is, cram at the last minute, there is an understanding of how they will perform. In the prior performance information that we have on individual candidates, it will reflect how they do perform in examinations in a, in a previous basis as well. So it will be fair in terms of their preparation for the examinations and equitable against those 
who don't leave it to the last moment and, and prepare on the way through. Um, and so we should meet, see no new advantage or disadvantage across the normal process using that approach. Okay, Justin, and thank you for that. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing with, with Daniel here because he's probably the last person I want to pick a fight with. But uh, what I would say, and I'd, I'd commend you for, is you, you have shown in some respects that when you do get uh, information back through the consultation, you will review practice, and you did in the rank order. However, based on my last question, the one that I probably need a little bit more information, because there is going to be an onus on teacher assessment here. And I, I mean, I get that and I accept that, and I think it's, it's right and appropriate because nobody knows the pupils more so than teachers. But in the consultation responses um, with regard to an appeal based on um, the teacher's assessment, uh, there could, it couldn't have been closer. 45.4% 40, non-appeal, 45.1% pro-appeal by people to teacher. Um, that being the case, is that going to be looked at again? And, and if not, um, I mean, bear in mind we're talking about, this is about pupils' results. Uh, whilst the respected teachers want to protect our teachers, the, the whole purpose of education is, is to prepare our pupils as best we can. Is that absolutely the best methodology at that level? And, and if it is, and if you accept that it is, for the 45.1% who opted, the, the thought actually had some kind of appeal mechanism in there would be better, who was, <laughs> I'm not sure if you can do this, by the way, who were those respondents? Was, were, those, were those school settings? Were those parents? Were those pupils? Who, who was that 45.1%? Where, where did that come from? Um, I, unfortunately, again, with all the paper in front of me, I don't have the actual number of the breakdown um, between the, the demographics of, of each uh, constituent part. Um, yes, it was very close. Uh, I think that if we were to further consult on this matter, we would run out of time in terms of implementation and, and meeting the issue of results uh, for August. Um, we had to have a, a short consultation on this matter and, and proceed. Um, I think that uh, without giving the figures, uh, my, my reading of the responses uh, was that uh, teacher representative bodies, centres, schools, etc., uh, were more in favour of protecting the teacher professional judgment and pupils and parents were less in favour of protecting the teacher uh, judgment. And it, and it is a, a very divided um, point of view. I think that to give pupils and parents assurances that if they feel that there is administrative error or that uh, process has not been followed, that has always been uh, a possibility, even when examinations normally occurred. And in those situations, there are complaint processes which have been used previously in the past uh, where centres can actually look at is there legitimacy um, in, the, in the complaint does it need upheld? And does that result in grade changes or rank order changes that the sender might have considered at that particular time? So that exists within inside the current arrangements. And on that basis, the concern that was cited on that uh, percentage of uh, people disagreeing with the, the proposal is met. And on the balance then, we felt it better to proceed. Um, it's more fair to proceed with the proposal as it exists. Sure, if I um, could just uh, comment on that as well, Trevor Carson here. Yes, here, Trevor. Uh, th th this was an area that Council uh, thought long and hard about whenever it was presented to us, because whenever you get figures that are split like that, uh, then you go, gosh, you, you know, it's like a sort of Damocles uh, hanging away. But what Council looked at was, what was in the best interest of all pupils uh, and to be as fair as possible right across the cohort. And that's where uh, we threw our weight behind it. And just to pick up on an earlier point about the, the small cohorts and the, the difficulties that uh, arise whenever you're uh, uh, doing grading, not just uh, in this uh, set of circumstances, but previously, uh, they would actually check those small cohorts manually to make sure that there were no errors or no unforeseen things that what were happening. Uh, so that's hopefully a bit of a reassurance to uh, members of the committee there. Uh, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Trevor, for that, that uh, intervention. Thank you, Justin and Sharon. Thank you. That's me done. Thanks. Thanks, Robbie. So just to recap and be clear there, that, that was on the two issues of provision for an appeal on teacher professional judgment, centre assessment grade, and 
provision for an appeal to be made on students' position in the rank order and say a position is that there should not be an appeal on either of those grounds? Well, CIA's proposal was that they, they shouldn't be um, an appeal against the centre assessed grade and the rank order, so the, the, the data submitted. Um, and we outlined in our original consultation the, the rationale um, behind that, uh, but we have noted that you know there is the issue of pupils or candidates being concerned that a centre might have conscious bias or uh, administrative process error, uh, of which they then need to follow what does exist, which is the complaint process. Okay. Uh, bring Catherine Kelly in, please. Thanks. Thanks, Chair, um, and thank you, Justin, Sharon, and Trevor, for your presentation and for meeting with us again today. Um, Justin, in relation to a helpline for parents and young people, this is something that both Karen and I have raised numerous times in the last few weeks with the department. We need a helpline for parents and young people um, to ensure that there, there's clear information and guidance on exams um, and that it can be accessed um, by calling a number. Um, many people contacting me do not have a relationship um, with their principal or, or centre. Um, can this be something that SIA will look at urgently? Um, to the chair, to go to go back uh, to the original point, we we have in the vast majority of cases been able to work with um, individuals through their centres, and the reason being is that the, the complexities of the exams being taken by that centre may need information provided by the centre in the first instance. I do recognise that there are maybe individual candidates out there, as you point out. Uh, and a small number who do not have a relationship with the, with the sender. And on that basis, um, we have had contacts uh, to see us through um, our email address and through our social media direct messaging, um, which we've been able to pick up. And all the information of our direct email address, etc., is on our website. Uh, it allows us to process the fine detail, but also to engage. If that candidate does have a sender, I think there are questions for us about why there isn't a relationship with the centre um, because centres enter learners for examinations and they do have a, a responsibility of the relationship with the candidate where they enter it but in some cases we understand that that relationship may be full or broken down and we need to provide that advice and, and, and information at that point so again i would encourage people to go sia.org.uk there's a section on COVID 19 and includes uh, information on our website and there's also SEER on both Facebook and social media channels and we will deal with um, any individuals in that situation in that way. And again, we have had correspondence from um, MLAs um, and written correspondence as well and we've been able to uh, address uh, those individual concerns where there are technical concerns where the, the candidate doesn't have a relationship. Uh, just, and, and, and I might add, we've, I think that we've had over a thousand queries um, from pupils and parents uh, in, in that respect, so we've been able to deal with it uh, in that. And as I said, most of those we've been able to resolve with the school or college, um, but there are a few we recognise that we need to deal with sensitively. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and just, just um, this is just a comment, um, and it's not directly linked to appeals, but it's something that I want to raise with yourselves today. Um, I would be extremely worried about our current year 11. Um, I have been contacted by, by many parents, teachers and young people themselves who feel it's unfair to expect Year 11 to undertake so many exams next year. Um, they believe this leaves them at a serious disadvantage and I agree. Um, I fear that this will impact greatly on their mental health. That's me, Chair. Thanks, Catherine. Can I, can I respond? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Justin. Um, uh, Absolutely, we're, we're conscious of the, the challenges to all pupils. Um, the examination arrangements, as they currently stand, have, have pretty much been with us since 1984, and here we are in an eight-week space making radical and detailed changes um, to the entire process and working with young people to make sure that they're aware and have an understanding and, uh, and trying to address those uncertainties as quickly as we possibly can. I think that in regards to the year 11s going forward, um, our advice on the GCSE, whether a modular takes of year 11, is that there are two options available. The year 11 candidate could sit the examination when it normally occurs, or they could receive 
um, a retrospective grade for that missed component if they don't sit that. And again, uh, on the SEER website, there are both videos and guidance from students and parents uh, to explain that, and that might alleviate some of that anxiety or some of that concern. Um, I do note the points from um, ASCO made to the committee uh, this morning, and as pointed out, we have a, a good relationship with ASCO um, where uh, it is constructive in trying to resolve these issues, and we recognise the, the challenges in regards to qualification specifications next year. Um, I do come back to a point that there is a, a, a bit of chicken and egg in understanding how a school will operate on day one so that we can make sure that the assessment arrangements operate correctly on, on day one, but also understand how teaching and learning will take place uh, in that new environment so that we can uh, reflect that in our considerations uh, of changes that we might make. Okay, thanks Catherine. Justin McNulty? Thanks Chair. Thanks Justin, Shane, or Sharon and uh, Deborah uh, for your, your information thus far. Um, can CEA share with you the tenor of the discussions it's had with the other jurisdictions in its capacity as the examinations regular and the respect of the National Qualification Framework? Um, I know you've mentioned discussions within and the Wales, given that numerous students will be intending um, on going to third level education in the South. Have you had any discussions with the OES, as part of education science or, or skills in Dublin, Athlone or Tullamore? Um, we, we have had discussions on a, on a broad jurisdictional basis. Um, throughout this process, I have been in communication with the State Exam Commissioner in the South. Um, I'm also um, involved with um, work with the Department of Education and Skills in the South, sharing our experiences, uh, knowledge and understanding um, across board North South. We also engage with CAO and I, IUA, um, again, around our process and our model, um, providing assurances on, on North South higher education uh, mobility. Uh, we've also been engaged with SQA in Scotland, um, uh, Scottish Qualifications Authority, because they have matters of consideration in regards to their qualifications and, and flow of uh, young people and to ensure consistency. Um, on, um, it, it would be fair to say that phone calls have been, in some cases, weekly, uh, in some cases, fortnightly, but very, very regular in understanding where we are. And again, we're engaging across regulators about the future, 2020-2021, um, uh, and how we might apply that. Obviously, with a shared brand like GCSEs and A-levels, uh, a lot of our work and thinking on that is with England and Wales at the moment, but it doesn't mean to say that we're not engaging um, both with uh, the South and with Scotland around their thinking also. Okay. Um, given, given the teacher set can we use uh, consistently and fairly at GCSE and A-level, could so that be reasonably applied also for other examinations? I'm talking here obviously about the post primary transfer. Um, and what, in your, from your opinions, is the wisdom of certain regions deciding that it's in the interests of communities and, and of parents and of pupils that the post primary transfer should be postponed, uh, whilst other regions are planning on as before? Can you give me your, your opinion, your informed opinion as to the wisdom of that approach? And should the approach not be universally adopted at this stage? Um, out, outside uh, the transfer, we've also had engagement with vocational qualifications. So um, I know a lot of schools and colleges in Northern Ireland use the variety of vocational qualifications available to them. And in the vast majority of cases, We've had agreement with the awarding organisations there uh, to take forward uh, calculated outcomes. It's not possible on all qualifications in the vocational space to do that because some of them have, for example, health and safety assessments that have to be conducted. And so awarding bodies are adapting where they possibly can those assessments so that those can be done uh, as soon as possible in order to reach, reach a grade. And, and those qualifications... Um, relate to maybe trade-based uh, qualifications. Um, in regards to transfer tests, I'm, I'm afraid I, I couldn't offer wisdom on that on the basis it, it's a private test operated by private bodies, um, and I don't have any of the information uh, about the, how they, they operate it or um, 
whether our approach to models would, would apply um, without that information. So I couldn't comment on that. Okay, guys, I know it must be like you are constantly, you're really, we're all in uncharted waters here, and you, especially in the Department of Education, and all the departments also constantly swimming against the tide. Um, how are you coping, guys? Um, if, I, if, I, if I could perhaps uh, say a word there, uh, thanks for, for that uh, question, because uh, I've genuinely been amazed at uh, how the senior team, especially in SEA, have coped with uh, what just seemed to be uh, a ricochet of issues that affect so many people's, young people's lives, and they've responded in the most incredibly professional way. Uh, that's not to say I don't ask questions about the organisational health and the health of individuals, uh, because uh, we are a pretty slim organisation, and it would be uh, remiss of the council not to be aware that if uh, we had a, a wave of sickness, the impact that that might have on our performance, and then uh, through that. Uh, the impact uh, wider across the education community. So really, I I'm, I'm, can't say anything uh, other than they've done a magnificent job to date, but also to say that we're not complacent because there's still a lot uh, that has to be done over the next two months especially, and then looking forward to 2021 and the issues that the current uh, situation has thrown up for that. So thanks, uh, Justin. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. Keep going. Thanks, thanks, Justin. Justin Edwards, can I just press you slightly on Justin's question? You're the Council for Curriculum Examinations and Assessments. You've cancelled examinations for children and young people at GCSE and A level, yet you don't have an opinion regards whether it is appropriate to examine children at age ten in this context. Um, I, I think that that that's just. A different question. The, the decision to cancel examinations was a, a ministerial decision. Um, I think that it was taken in the in the light of the health advice, um, and we were thrust into a position of providing a, a technical solution where examinations are no longer uh, available. Uh, the technical solution and the options in which we developed were very much in the context of what information can we gather, what information do we have. How do we build an approach here that is fair um, across uh, all? How does that information, when we gather it, um, protect learners' interests, but also uh, provide assurances to the, the profession? And I think the point was made um, earlier this morning uh, by another body, you know, the, the, the challenges of indemnity and um, issues of teacher professional judgment uh, come into play on that. And all these have a broad range of factors that require an internal knowledge of, of your system and your approach. And I think that um, in regards to other systems and approach, you really have to dig into the, the detail um, of that approach before you can come to a conclusion on what the best models or options are to proceed. Okay. And so okay. um, that, that's, that's why I'm, I'm reluctant to say <laughs> you, you could or you couldn't. I think it's Extre quite simple. Extremely reluctant, so I'll move on. Um, <laughs> you, you have demonstrated adaptation and innovation is is possible in this context so we we recognize that closing question for me justin can say confirm that subject officers are engaging in detailed research and consultation with principals and head of subject departments about possible changes to uh, the 2021 assessments for gcse asa and a level and if so can schools be given assurances that such information will be made available well ahead of the commencement of the new academic year? We have started engagement on uh, the thinking of what we can do. Um, I think we have to be careful uh, considering subject content versus assessment instruments. I think that consideration of adaptation of assessment instruments in the likelihood of medical advice takes primacy here. Um, I think that in regards to subject content, uh, I, I heard, you know, and I've heard calls for reductions in subject content. And while standards could be maintained, um, we have to consider that subject content has a bearing on the learner's future education. 
material you cover now builds towards what you might do at university, for example. And reducing that uh, in some way may leave learners exposed as they progress through their education. So balancing short-term corrections and long-term impacts is something that we have to consider very detailed at, at a high level. That, that being said, there is engagement going on at the, the subject level, and as soon as we can communicate, uh, we will. I suspect it will come out in phases, um, and that phases will be dependent on the medical advice and also information about day, day one teaching as that becomes available to us, but we are engaging on that. Will, will it be uh, prior to the commencement of the next academic year? I think some of the information will, but we have to remember that COVID is a, a, a variable situation. So we have examinations in November, January, and next summer. So you're trying to consider a window that goes forward by 12 months. What will be available to us in terms of medical advice, social distancing, etc., that will allow us to do examinations in a particular form by next summer versus what we might do uh, in November. So my view is to get as much information as we possibly can out give uh, consistency and give uh, reliable information. But like all agencies, we are, we are subject to the, the, the changing winds of the, of the health response, and, and rightly so, we, we should adapt and amend as that information becomes available. Okay. Um, I, I, I mean, I'll, sorry, just, 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 uh, just yeah. briefly, folks, just briefly. In addition to um, amendment of curriculum content, ASCO also seemed today to be suggesting that ensuring that any examination had a, as wide a range of uh, question response options as possible as well in order to cater for the fact that there may well, given the unprecedented exceptional circumstances, be different areas of the curriculum given more time and attention than others. Can you respond to that, Justin? I think that uh, that is one option. Um, I don't think it's the only option and I don't think it's the only option that we should consider. Okay. I think that uh, we need, it, it is better for us all to keep all options open. The uh, Department of Education has commissioned for advice from SIA on options. We will get that information to the department as soon as possible okay. um, so that the department and the minister can make an informed decision. But I do think that let's keep options open um, okay. because actually reconstructing day one uh, and what learning looks like will have an important bearing on what we want to do with uh, our exams and uh, specifications. Okay, I need to bring us to a close, but I, I think I heard Daniel and Trevor there. Daniel, if you can make your comment extremely brief yeah, and then allow like Trevor very, to round up. Well, just to thank members for their for their uh, contribution today and for their presentation, although there's quite a bit I didn't agree with, as you will know, but that's, that's the, the joys of this thing. Uh, there's many principals and teachers concerned, as there are parents. My concern here is, and I'm asking that you go away and think about this, these are children and young people. And the concern I have from the presentation today, whilst a lot of work has gone on, and I've no doubt uh, the, the, the staff at CR are working tirelessly, we have to remember that there's children and young people at the heart of this all the time. And my concern is that there's a big focus on protecting the system instead of actually protecting our children. And I think that we need to realise at all times it's about our children and young people, that's not about the system. Thank you. Okay. Trevor, you'd like to close us up? Yes, yeah, just, just very quickly. Uh, in my opening comments, I said uh, council at the heart of our decisions was the interests of young people, uh, not a statistical model, not matching systems, but young people and their best interests. So, uh, and then to follow that up, the, the question about what happens next, uh, un unprecedentedly, uh, council have been meeting on a weekly basis, and it is our intention to look very closely. Uh, and discuss the options that might need uh, to be uh, implemented going forward from September 20, uh, uh, 20 through to June 21. And uh, as soon as uh, we're asked to give advice to the Minister, uh, I think SIA Council will be in a position to do that. So thanks for the opportunity to, to come along today, okay. Chair. Th th thanks, Trevor. Very briefly, so the Education Minister is yet to seek your advice with regards to next year's examination and curriculum assessment process? Um, Chairman, uh, the, uh, the department has written to see us 
and, and it's seeking that advice and we're trying to pull that together as quickly as we okay, can. Okay, I understand. Okay, Justin, Trevor, Sharon, thank you very much indeed for your uh, time with us today. We will obviously gather our views and uh, send that uh, to you as a matter of urgency, given the time scales to which you are working. And as other members have done, we, we thank you for everything you're doing to try to ensure that we do have a fair process for our children and young people this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, can I ask the clerk to summarise uh, actions or requests resulting from the briefing today? Um, and also, we will need to determine members' views on the SEA consultation on exam appeals. Clerk? So, Chair, if, we're, if members are content, I'll summarise where I think the committee is, and this is where the committee then tells me that I'm wrong. So, um, in short, then, the committee uh, welcomes the provision of clarity and certainty for children and young people in schools, um, but uh, indicates that uh, more advice, more communication with schools is required and recommends, again, the establishment of a helpline for, uh, for children and young people now, and particularly, obviously, in August. Um, the committee uh, stresses the importance of fairness and transparency in any exams and exams appeals process, and its concerns are around the statistical model that it has not yet uh, fully developed, that the details of it have not been communicated, including you know, how it might link to uh, the other examination bodies. Additionally, then, uh, the committee takes the view that um, any system should allow for cohort variation and for outliers so that if schools make an improvement or there are individuals within schools that teachers believe have indeed made an improvement, then that teacher assessment should be given um, due weight and due consideration. Um, and that therefore uh, the appeals process should allow um, for appeals uh, against the, um, the, whatever the statistical model indicates. And that the committee also notes the complexity around the issue of uh, individual pupil appeals and how that might impact on uh, on rank order so chairperson members you want to put the clerk right what i've got wrong there any members wish to comment and then just around just around the, the, the they talked a lot about the statistical model and about their great faith in this model you know, which doesn't even technically exist yet uh, and it hasn't been tested so there's a, there's a real concern on my part, I know, and I'm sure many principals and teachers across the, the, the country, that, that there's not enough detail around uh, GCSEs. Uh, they, they keep talking about England. Uh, England's a different system. Um, I just found that presentation quite quite worrying, to be very honest. And, you know, they talked about statistics and talked about models the whole way through it. You know, where's the children and young people we mentioned here? Because this is ultimately what it's about, and it's about their best interests. And that, that's the reason I was so blunt throughout that entire presentation. I just couldn't understand what, what, uh, where on earth are we getting this from. And teachers and principals and schools, parents as well, will be very concerned about what they've heard there today, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, yeah, I understand that. Are members content that we've captured those concerns um, adequately and, and for us to write to see you in that regard? Yeah, I think it's yeah. captured. Chair, yes. Yeah. Uh, Chair, could I just also ask, um, uh, Mr. McCrossan had asked a question which I couldn't quite catch about fees. Um, so I think are we writing to CIA just asking them to set out the options that they're putting before the department in respect of, was it the refunding of, of exam fees? Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, in, in, uh, the, because the, the, the test hasn't, hasn't been taken and the exams yeah. have been taken, I'm just wondering about the refund for schools and whether they'll be refunded in whole or in part. Yeah. Um, I think that's the, that's the important thing because this is a substantial sum of money, a substantial sum of money. So there'll be a lot of people wondering what's going to happen in relation to that. I think we do need clarification around it. Right. Sounds good. I think maybe the minister might be with us. Chair. Okay. Members content? Content. Agreed. Just pop on to number eight. Okay. We'll move to agenda item eight then, members. Uh, it's our Department of Education oral briefing. Uh, can I check uh, before, just before I welcome and introduce you properly, that the Minister of Education, the Permanent Secretary, and the Deputy Secretary are on the line? Uh, Chair, um, I'm here. It's Derek here, and John Smith's here, but the Minister has not yet joined us. He's currently in another meeting, which must be running a little bit late, but he did intend to join if possible. Okay. Um, 
Shall we? Do you want to take agenda item seven, Clark, or um, go ahead? Go ahead. Yep. Uh, I, I would go ahead with since go we ahead. have the permanent secretary. Okay, yep. Derek. If you're content, we'll proceed, and and I'll refer members to a briefing paper from the committee clerk at page one six six, an update on COVID correspondence at page one seven five, correspondence from Lurgan College, Wallace High School, Coleraine Grammar, and St Patrick's Grammar. Arma on post primary transfer at page 278. A response from the Governing Bodies Association on post primary transfer at 285. A response from AQE on post primary transfer at 289. Correspondence from the ERA Committee Reconnectivity Issues on Home Learning and Rural Broadband at page 293. And a copy of correspondence to the Minister regarding the return of children to school from St. Patrick's Primary School in Cross McGlenn at page 298. Can also refer members to table papers which include a letter from the Minister regarding the restart programme, the latest Department of Education COVID-19 situation report, which includes updates on new teacher, graduates, restraint and seclusion in special schools, the uptake of childcare support package, data on distance learning and the work of the multidisciplinary support team. Uh, by way of welcome, can I uh, welcome our uh, Permanent Secretary, Derek Baker, John Smith, Deputy Secretary, and, and I think the Education Minister in, in due course. Um, from this oral briefing, uh, can I, I thank the Department for the written responses that we've received uh, to date and invite the officials and the Minister in, when he joins us to make a short opening statement updating the Committee on COVID-19 related matters. Okay, Chair, thank you. I'll, I'll be very brief. I'll take the report as read. Um, obviously, last week we closed applications from substitute teachers, but we're um, applying some flexibility there. If some substitute teachers are coming in late, fewer applied than we had estimated. So we're working through all of those, and the payments will be made uh, in the middle of June in respect of those. Um, so I'm not saying anything more about substitute teachers at this stage. The school meals um, payments continue. I think everything's going pretty well there. Minister Weir will be meeting Minister Hargey um, to talk about holiday hunger, which obviously is a slightly separate issue, but is in this space. Uh, but no decisions have been taken on that. Um, there is a lot of data and numbers and facts and figures in there. I'm not going to go through all of that. Um, you've obviously had a presentation from SIA on the appeals process, um, so I'll not rehearse that. Just interestingly, on key workers, yesterday schools had the highest number of pupils ever attending. Now, it's still a very small number, but we had over 2,000 pupils attending schools yesterday. That's vulnerable children and children of key workers. Um, the, process, the processing of applications in respect of the child care support scheme continues. As you will see, much higher number of applications in respect of child minders than expected. Um, and lower applications in respect of settings. Now, the reference group is looking at all of that and considering particularly the settings issues. Um, it's not in your report, Chair, but you referenced the letter that the committee received from the minister dated the 2nd of June. Um, the practitioners group um, met yesterday for the first time 20 school principals and um, officials from uh, both the department and some of the managing authorities to look at issues. Um, there were actually two meetings um, covering all school settings, preschool, primary school, special school and post-primary, um, all uh, sizes of schools, I should say, and geographical coverage. Um, and di di different management types. So they're meeting again tomorrow to focus on draft guidance, and they have agreed that they will focus initially on developing guidance in key areas and get that out the door as quickly as they can during June on a drip beat basis, on the premise that not everything is going to be known 
by the end of June. We don't know what the medical advice, for example, will be in respect of use of public transport for the end of August. So that will be evolving. But in terms of social distancing and hygiene and physical protection and the day one practical arrangements, that's where the primary focus will be. And as the practitioners group signs off in guidance, it will go up through the various reference bodies, including the teaching trade unions, signed off by the minister, and that will be issued during the course of June. That's all I'll say at this stage, Chair, by way of introduction, so happy to try and answer any questions the committee might have. Okay, happy to bring members in at this point. Uh, Deputy Chairperson, Karen Mullen. Thank you, Chair, um, uh, and thanks again for your update and the papers that have been provided for us. Um, just in relation to, I suppose we had a paper, we had papers there in the June monitoring, um, and, and obviously we have been discussing for the last number of weeks, and we discussed it earlier this morning too, just on what will be required in relation to PPE and all of that there. Um, you know, we have equipment, signs, screens, everything that's going to be needed in school. So just wondering, have you, obviously I would imagine that you have prepared a bid um, for equipment, and would that be bid for uh, at this time, or when will it be likely to be bid for? Well, the, the Minister, as yet, has not fully signed off our June monitoring bid. And there's actually two exercises going on, as you probably know, uh, from the Department of Finance. Uh, the Finance Minister has obviously asked all departmental ministers to look at their budgets generally and reprioritisation across the course of the financial year in light of the COVID-19 emergency and what that means both by way of additional costs that will be incurred and perhaps for some lucky department savings that might emerge. And at the same time, there is a kind of normal June monitoring bid going on and the two will merge. I would say, Karen, that you know, obviously we are incurring additional costs and have done and have been funded as such in the areas of free school meals, for example. In terms of equipment, now I'm taking a bit of a flyer at this before the Minister has formally signed off our bids. If we need additional capital equipment, I would be confident that we could bid for that out of the capital budget, given that there has been a slowdown in construction in the first part of the year for obvious reasons, although we would like yeah. to keep construction going. But a lot of our projects have not proceeded as planned. And as you know, we have a budget of about 155 million for capital, and we will need to look at how that will be reprioritised. But, and again, not wanting to get ahead of the minister, we can reprioritise that into physical equipment, even ICT equipment, as opposed to buildings, if we have an underspend in buildings. For resource, it's a wee bit different. Um, and we will have to bid for that in the normal way, you know, if we were going to do anything on holiday hunger and we were in the lead in that or with communities or jointly. Um, but the Minister has yet to sign off on both of those issues, the reprioritisation and June monitoring. Thank you, Derek. Um, uh, just, I suppose, it's something that has come to light. It's my understanding that in May, this year, Derek, an email has went out from the Education Authority to all voluntary grammars um, and grant maintained integrated schools saying that if these schools had a cash flow, flow problem, that EA has secured resource to cover two to three years annual accrual for voluntary and grant maintained teachers' pay. I suppose all the LMS schools had to lay this accrual money aside over the past three years and that was on personal more ability to spend. Um, and as you know, often requiring them to make cuts. So can, I, can I ask if all schools will be available to avail of this additional funding to assist with teachers' pay award? Could I just say, first of all, um, Karen and Chair, the Minister, has happily joined us. But I'll just oh, okay. take that question. This, this was about additional funding that may be needed to cover pay. Um, I mean, I think the first point, Karen, is that in terms of 
pay and particularly back pay, that was covered off in the budget and in the allocations that were made as part of the uh, aggregated schools budget, which has been signed off by the Minister. And I think the committee by now probably has received a table setting out the disposition of the department's budget and the percentage uplifts, uh, if there was an uplift, that is, across the various dimensions. I mean, this thing is all with swings and roundabouts, Karen, as you well know, because yeah. uh, voluntary grammars and GMIs on the one hand would say, well, the system provides a funding safety net for controlled and maintained schools uh, should they fall into deficit, whereas voluntary grammars and grant maintained integrated schools have to go to the bank and get an overdraft or borrow and don't have that safety net. So this is all about being fair to all sectors. And it is a very complicated issue. The Minister is going to... Yeah, no, Karen, Karen, I appreciate this. I apologise to the committee as well. I was on a, a Zoom call in relation to the development proposal, which obviously normally would be a, just a schedule, sort of um, the school would come in and, and, and meet me. And obviously I, I was keen to hear, if you like, about what the particular points that, that were to be raised in connection. So I couldn't just sort of say... Okay. I'm sorry, I've Minister, run down to the... But Minister, sorry, in relation... Minister, in relation, if I in relation just, just pause for a sorry. second. Just, just in my role as chair, welcome you to the committee and advise okay. you, as I had advised members, that I, I was uh, politely reprimanded for the length of our committee meetings, the length of okay. my questioning and the length of members' responses. Okay. Just, so I'll, just I'll in, to... include the length of your answers and not forget okay. measures. So if, okay. if we all stay okay. concise. Thanks, Minister. I, okay, the, the only point I would add to what Derek and Minister... Sorry, the, the only point I would add to what, what Derek has raised as well in terms of the uh, issue on VGS and GMI, very specifically this year, um, because we received, having checked this out with finance, because we received a particularly large sum to effectively clear uh, deficits, there was a, I think, additional requirement we got uh, that came with that, that money, which essentially meant that we had to create a clear separate budget line because some of that money was attributable directly to the VGS GMI side of it. So uh, effectively ring fencing that as a particular um, uh, amount uh, was, I suppose, part of the requirement, I think, that we got from the amount of money that received off, off DOF. There is also, Derek has made the point about the um, probably lack of flexibility that VGS and GMI has with their budget compared to others. I suppose also in the current circumstances, there are particular hits uh, which uh, BTS and GMI schools will be will be receiving and have received over particularly uh, money in relation to meals, which are not there for other schools, which are effectively in other schools, will be absorbed by the EA centrally. Yeah, yeah. And, and it is, you know, budgets are so tight and it is about uh, equity for all schools. And just given the tightness around the school budget, the schools who have accrued the one percent savings will they be compensated by the department as 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 being proposed for the voluntary grammars who who did not have to accrue the savings? No, the voluntary grammars in the GMI schools are on the basis of they have to show particular levels of hardship. There's a particular uh, element of that. You know, the money is flowing through that. Whenever say they've accrued, I mean, it's it's basically effectively to some extent EA have effectively top top slice that. This is a, a one-off situation. It is a requirement of DOF um, this year in connection with that. And what it would highlight is that for uh, the BTS and GMI schools, the particular loss, whenever I'm talking about issues around school meals, for instance, uh, that is not an issue where there's a minor hit. That is uh, stuff that, for instance, our estimate, because we put into the, uh, in relation to the COVID side of it, an estimate of around about 4.2 million simply for, um, for this term, for instance. So uh, I suspect overall they will actually probably be in the worst position, even if all this money um, was allocated, but it, it's not. There's not a position, for instance, if that money is not in cash terms drawn down, it is part of a sort of ring fence direct budget line from DOF on that, that basis, and consequently can't simply be redistributed to other schools, even even if there wasn't uh, that level of pressure uh, observed. So, you know, there isn't there isn't additional money to throw around other schools beyond what has been allocated in terms of the increase to the ASB across the across the piece this year. Yeah. Thank you, Minister Chair. That's me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Robin Newton. Is Robin there? 
I think he is, but he might be on mute. Robin, are you on mute? No, I guess not. No. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm pleased the way the uh, reports are going from Derek on a regular, on a weekly basis now. Uh, but maybe could I just ask on the area around distance learning, Minister, and the continuity of learning, uh, you'd indicated about the, uh, addressing the socio-economic deprivation uh, problems with extended number of additional number of uh, of uh, laptops being available. Uh, to where are we with that at the moment and the well, landing of those devices? I think I think I think the, the EA is working through that. As, as indicated, I think we've got the three stages bit of using what's in the system, the procurement uh, direct bit at EA, and then what additionally will be, will be needed. Um, I don't have particular figures uh, beyond what, what's already been in the public domain in connection with that. Look, I think the other thing moving ahead, uh, there's a wider part of continuity of learning, which will also be uh, how as well we address, particularly through the digital side, and particularly as we recover schools, you know, what, what role is there and how do we actually ensure, which ETI is working with us on, on how do we ensure consistency of delivery in terms of remote learning, and also whether um, COVID, it also creates some level of opportunity. So, you know, is there a level of virtual learning that, 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 that can be done? Uh, you know, how do we, uh, what are the practical issues around, for instance, trying to ensure that, that for particular years, can a class, for instance, be delivered with some people in class and some people out of class? You know, there's all those technical issues which I think are being worked through and will form part of the wider sort of um, recovery side of it. But, yeah, no, I think on the devices side of it, yes, that, that is progressing. I don't have an exact snapshot of where we are in terms of numbers on it. So, Chair, maybe for the uh, next report then, if it uh, could be included within the, the, the report to the committee. Uh, for the, to for, confirm I was going to say for the... Uh, and Chair, for the, the uh, position of succinctness, we're happy to do so. Yeah. Okay. Thank Thanks. you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Daniel? Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, and uh, hello, Derek uh, and uh, Minister John. I think it's John there. Um, he hasn't. He's, he's not looking after Oma today, so he's, uh, or at least this morning, so. Uh, well, well, don't speak too soon, Minister. I'll be on the phone to you. Uh, <laughs> Just in relation to, well, first of all, Minister, I think it's the first time you've been to force since the announcement around sub-teachers, because we missed last week, I think, so thank you for the efforts and work around that. I'm glad we got to the 12 million figure in the end. It came as a considerable relief, so I want to put on record my thanks, because I applied significant pressure to you and the Finance Minister in that regard, and uh, I'm glad it came to the right outcome. I, 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 just, I just wonder, Daniel, what you've got to tweet about. Uh, no, that's, no, that's resolved. I'm digging. I'm digging. <laughs> Just in relation to uh, your overall statement, because I know we're tight for time, so I, I, I want I want to just cut to the chase so the chair doesn't uh, uh, put me in detention. But Minister, just in relation to your overall statement to the assembly about alternative awarding arrangements for summer 2020 GCSE, AS, and A levels, you stated in the assembly that A level students this year would be given a calculated grade based on a combination of teacher professional judgment, including grading and rank order by schools and statistical modelling. What, what happens if the calculated grade and the statistical modelling do not match? You also noted that schools have a wealth of information to evidence the achievements of their students. Are you aware that the CF plan not to permit schools to use some of this? Uh, they say it would not be fair to do so. Have you any comment on them? Things, the, the issue, I suppose, is, is, is two things. I mean, like, uh, from the point of view of teachers, they can use their professional judgment. They know the, the pupils, and that is on the basis of, of what they believe would be the thing, what would be the, the answer in, in connection with that. So I'm not sure there's a bar from CSA saying you can't use your judgment in that regard. Quite the reverse, in, in that regard, whether they're maybe saying is you can't, you shouldn't really base it on a particular um, methodology or whatever, you know, or, or too rigid in that regard. You actually got to use your judgment. Whenever you're saying, I think the, the statistical modelling, I think the idea of statistical modelling is to act as um, you get the calculated grades and the ranking from the school. The statistical modelling, I suppose, is to then mould that into a final into a final result, um, and that's to try and get a level of consistency with with schools. Because um, you know, it, I suppose, let me put it this way: if I maybe give you an example on it, Daniel, if, if you and I, if you and I were on an interview panel uh, marking somebody. Uh, it may well be that we both agree here is the best candidate, 
but my scoring system may end up being a lot, it may be, be a lot different, either more lenient or tighter than, than yours. And this is about trying to ensure then consistency. So there's always a danger that you might get some schools trying to be very protective of their, 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 their pupils will consciously or subconsciously will, will, will you know, make calculated grades that, that, are, that are well above what, what they should be. There's others who may be unduly harsh, and it's about trying to, the statistical modelling is to try to provide consistency around that uh, so that you, you take that level of maybe unconscious bias out of the, the system. Uh, and and you, you make a few interesting points there, Minister, but I think our suggestion to CA today was that they engage with the school, particularly the teachers with the cold face, and reach some form of consensus around the grade then. Uh, but just in terms of the data, uh, and I know you weren't listening because you had a previous meeting, so I don't want to put you on an awkward position, but the, uh, the data CA has, uh, especially for GCSE and particularly for small cohorts, is very, very weak and very frustrating to hear them defend it. Uh, it can't be used the way that CA propose, Minister, and certainly can't be used in similar ways to that of England because we just don't have the data on GCSE the same way as we do as A-level, and certainly not compared to England. Uh, this will uh, expose CA, and this is my concern, exposing the judicial review, and it will be a much weaker position than exam boards in England who have additional data. Well, sorry? I, yeah, I'm not quite I'm not sure of all the detail in relation to that. Look, it's undoubtedly the case, and I think, to be fair, CA have been very upfront about this as well, that any form of... Um, we've got, I think, the most robust system that we can in terms of then being able to be able to award grades. They will be the first to say that, uh, that awarding of grades through any other methodology is not as sound and secure as an examination. And to some extent, there, there always has to be a level of, of extrapolation. I think the issue is there's not really a particularly great uh, alternative. Um, and look, there will always be somebody who will try and make some level of legal challenge uh, to that, I think. Uh, as far as we're concerned, we believe that, that what has been put in place is as robust as, as, it, as it can be. And I think, uh, you know, with judicial review, in a, in a previous life I, I did a term sort of helping to teach judicial review, um, is, uh, you know, there is also an issue about reasonableness. There's an issue about a level of necessity uh, on, on that basis and making sure that whatever systems are, are robust. But robustness is, is, to some extent, judged against what... Um, what is doable in the circumstances rather than what would pertain in an ideal world. Yeah, and, and I, I, I understand that, but uh, like, uh, and again, I know we couldn't listen in because you were busy, but if you had a heard CS uh, presentation today, I could assure you that as many questions as I have in relation to their approach to this, they, they seem to be prepared to die in a ditch over a model that they haven't even finalised yet, nor has it been tested, and that's not reasonable and, and certainly isn't reasonable for uh, those affected and will cause great concern, Minister, to uh, uh, teachers, principals uh, and also children. You know, it, it's also the case in terms of, in terms of te I mean, if in theory you were to run this in terms of dry runs and tests and arrange that, this is also going to be the practical, but it does kind of help that, that uh, particularly as most regards A-level, but also GCSE, that pupils get their, their grades in a timely manner. And, and, and in fact, they basically have to in that, in that regard. And for example, you know, if we were in a situation that you went through 20 different tests to, to try and make sure this was robust as possible, you'd probably reach the same conclusion anyway. But you probably wouldn't then have those grades before Christmas, which isn't a great deal of use for people who are looking to progress. So, look, there are restrictions, which mean this is not an uh, we're not working in an ideal world in that regard. Um, but look, I would trust the professional judgment of of, of CA. Obviously, I can't comment on any exchanges that were that were made. I, I didn't didn't hear them in that in that regard. No, but I know you'll be as stunned as I was when you hear them. But uh, beyond that, Minister, just just in terms of because I'm, I, I, I'm very I'm, Daniel, I'm very difficult to stun. <laughs> well, I am too, but I was stunned today, I can assure you. Uh, question, uh, just another question, Minister. Does the Department know how many school staff will be shielding come September? I know this is a concern as well. Uh, how do you plan to handle this once schools come back? Because this is also well, causing considerable stress for principals. Well, look, uh, in, terms of, in terms of staffing issues, will be part of the overall advice. In terms of shielding, we've seen uh, both recently and indeed as part of the work in progress uh, that in terms of the advice on shielding um, has changed. It, it, there are particular um, aspects in terms of the school system in England where they've given advice on shielding, but it's one of the areas that the executive and chief medical officer and chief scientific officer um, will be 
they are doing a level of review shielding. One of the one of the issues was perhaps as a precaution. We, there was a very white blanket thrown out in terms of shielding, which was not, I think, um, needed to be done very quickly in that regard. And the feeling perhaps that that was not necessarily as focused or precise as, as it should be. That will be part of the, the process as well. But it is also the case, look, there's one of the things I think I want to nail in relation to this. There may be certain specific tasks which if somebody is shielding, then for instance a school will, will need to have somebody physically on the ground fulfilling. But for example, in terms of shielding, and again, if somebody is, is shielding because they are ill, clearly there is subject. Simply because somebody is shielding does not mean they are not, they are not working. And there are vast numbers across the public sector who are currently shielding and, and doing their, their work. So part of that Part of that will also be that from schools, for uh, anybody who is not ill, they will still be expected to do work. And part of that will be if we are in a blended situation of classroom learning and remote learning, some of that will need to be a level of, it'll be difficult to do, but there'll need to be a level of flexibility of approach of the way that uh, tasks are, are divided. And it may well be that, for instance, some of those who are shielding will taking on a greater responsibility in terms of some of the remote learning um, or preparation of lessons compared to those who are maybe directly in the classroom. Yeah, but Minister, what about the situation where a physics teacher is required for practical lessons that they're not very easy to come by, as I'm sure you'll know, uh, and that certainly can't be taught from uh, home. So uh, and it, look, it, it, situations for the physical part of the curriculum that will need to be fulfilled. No, I, and I, look, I, the, the, I think you make, you make a valid point in relation to that, Daniel, but there's, I suppose there's, 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 there's two points to be not Generally speaking, there is provision for the broader sickness absence of it. If there is, as I said, look, and it may be beyond this, if there are certain absolute practicalities which would mean that something can't be done from home in that regard, then, you know, they would need somebody physically to be in doing that. Some of that will be on the basis of, of being flexible as regards timetables. But the other thing as well, on that well be it may well be that certain physical activities, certain practical demonstrations may have to be done either in a completely different way or in some cases may not be able to be done uh, at all. There will be some level of, and this is not just an open and wide problem, it's across the board, where there will have to be some level of adjustment to how the curriculum is, is delivered because there will be certain practical things which just will not be able to be done uh, with levels of social distancing or in current circumstances, but we're in an evolving situation as regards that. Who would pay for that, Minister? Who would pay for a situation where there's... You know, so, you know the budget can't obviously cope with these things in this current situation. Sorry? Who would pay? Who would pay for those? Well, so the, so the normal, the normal, the normal position is that if if a substitute lead teacher is needed, then the normal procedures in terms of payment uh, take place. But the point, the point I'm making is simply because somebody is shielding, doesn't mean that they're not going to be working. If somebody is ill, if there is somebody that that in terms of the way it works, but the, the normal processes will will apply in relation to that. But uh, there's got to be, realistically, in relation to this, and given where the executive is as a whole, there's not going to be some vast sum of money that suddenly will be available to cope with, with every situation to have the ideal. So people will have to be very inventive across the board in terms of their budget. You know, I, I would love to be able to get an extra billion pounds to put it into, into things, on it, but we've got to be realistic. That's not, not going to happen. I okay, appreciate Daniel, that. I'll finish I need, on this, I need to move on if you bring your questions to a close up. Yeah. Daniel, thanks. I'll finish on this point. Yep. Uh, Minister, I, I completely know and understand and appreciate the significant pressures on the central budget of the Department for Education, but I also know, as you do, uh, that pr principals are under tremendous pressure. Uh, and I know that the, the term inventive has been used uh, in, in many occasions in relation to school budgets, but you know they need to be magical, in fact. Uh, to bring about money from a pot that hasn't got any left in it, particularly around the pressures that's going to be added to schools under PTE and the various extra requirements well, look, for the safety of children. Well, sorry, schools, I, look, I, in terms of PPE, first of all, there will be direct guidance in, in relation to, and I think sometimes people slightly run away with themselves in terms of PPE on what they believe. I mean, the general advice on, on PPE will be PPE will only be needed in very, very limited circumstances in connection with also, in terms of what can be drawn down in terms of PPE, there has been a certain amount that's been available through DOF, uh, which EA will be able to, to allocate. But, you know, the idea that, that people would be routinely going about in PPE in general in, in schools is not one which um, is, is, is going to be... My, my, sorry for you, my point isn't specifically on PPE. My point is on the affordability of the pressures that exist as a result of COVID. Like, who's going to pay for school cleaning that is going to be required continually? when schools return, that those sorts and of questions are all being raised. Yeah, 
And, and from that point of view, look, we will have to cope as best we can in relation. There will be some additional costs that will be there on that. There will also across the system probably be certain times when there will be things that will not be needed as, as before, or maybe not able to be done as best uh, before, which in and of itself will probably create some level of easements as, uh, as well. But yes, there will be there will be a need for um, probably a greater level of cleaning in relation to it. Again, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't put that at, at a, a level which, which overemphasizes that in the unrealistic territory either on that, on that basis on it. It's got to be something which is then consistent with the, the health and safety advice on it. But look, across the board, and this is, this is going to be true of all aspects of, of life, there is not going to be an unlimited budget in that regard. And the idea that, yes, schools will have a finite budget, so does, so does education, so does actually the executive as a whole. And it's got to be within that, that context that there's got to be a realisation. Maybe that means things will not be able to be done as well or as perfectly as they've been done before in the past, but I think ultimately we will have to cope. Okay, I need to bring in, uh, if I could bring in Robbie Butler, please, thanks. Robbie, yes, thanks. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, Derek, and John. Um, just want to thank you again. I think Robin uh, Newton had said earlier on about the, the weekly update. Really do appreciate it, and particularly this week, um, we received, I think yesterday, some detail on the restart program, Minister. Um, so I uh, have just two questions, and the first one's going to just really hinge around that side. Uh, Derek, before you, before you come on, Minister Derek has given a pretty good synopsis of the difficulties that are uh, calculated with regard to dates and stuff. But the, the good thing is that we know what those problems are. So I just want to uh, ask you, um, is it likely that there might even be some scenario planning information for uh, head teachers in the month of June? Uh, Askel Ron earlier and said it would be helpful if they got some uh, good information in around the middle of June to allow um, schools to prep for opening perhaps at the end of August and September and even allowing for those things which are outside your control, which is COVID. We do know what they are, we do know that, what measures sort of need to be in place. So w would there be the potential of uh, some scenario based planning that would allow in certain instances that, that schools will reopen safely uh, at their normal time? Uh, yes, the answer is yes is, uh, in relation to that. Uh, look, uh, our aim would be to have, I know like, certain things may, may change as time evolves, but basically I suppose the aim would be to get um, all levels of guidance out um, before the summer, but also actually, yes, there will be stuff that will be um, in place by the middle of June, uh, and from that point of view, as soon as we have stuff nailed down, we will drip feed. You know, I mean, look, there's an argument about you want to have as comprehensive as possible, but there's no point in holding on to a particular piece of advice for a week or two. Um, so, yes, as soon as information, obviously in terms of prioritisation, some of the issues around hygiene, around personal protection, etc., uh, will be will be given as as soon as possible in that in that regard. Yeah, I appreciate that, and and, and the succinct answer is really good, and and it is good. It's good that the answer is yes, and that, and this this committee can help you in any way. I see that. We obviously will. My, my second question, and hopefully it'll be a succinct answer, Minister, um, is around the AQE testing. So, um, obviously, within this last week, you've had a number of schools, uh, and Justin will probably touch on it in his area, which have withdrawn from the process, and we have Lagan College similarly doing that. Um, and I, I don't want to add that, other than to ask you, have, have other schools been in touch with you to indicate that in any uh, there's, a, there's a great swathe of, of selection, selective schools that are in a position where they are going to consider opting out of AQ and GL this year. And, um, and if you can give us any update on any other work that you've done with regard to any other scenarios or contingencies well, that look, may be required. On the basis of we're always, we're always discussing with people what actions can be taken in terms of broad levels of mitigation in connection with this. Now, I, you know, I've made it clear, for instance, that I think one of the key aspects of this, which I think would be uh, welcomed particularly by parents, is I think there will need to be an acknowledgement from AQE and PPTC that uh, the, the nature of tests, the level where people are in terms of the curriculum this year, that the, the standard those tests are put at will need to reflect the disruption to the, the curriculum. So there's always levels of, of um, discussion taking place. You know, we've not been made aware of by any other school that... Um, uh, in relation to, um, you know, we're thinking about doing this or whatever. Look, it tends to be the nature of the things you tend to find those things out whenever they actually make the announcement in, in connection with it. 
Uh, look, what I would say is I think what is highlighted over the last week, Latin College, to be fair to them, um, are largely speaking a school which, which has operated um, a lot of streamed entry, but are generally speaking a non-selective school on the basis that they're moving effectively from 65% of their intake being non-selective to 100%. That's probably a relatively easy bit. I think the weaknesses of the system are perhaps more shown by the situation in Uri and Kilkeel, where uh, the indications have been given that, yes, they're not going to use the GL. In their statement, I think they've made reference to a tweak, if you like, on their sub-criteria, but their sub-criteria in terms of the main bits are all based around the idea of uh, connections with the school, who your relative is. And this does come down to a situation that if you are going to say we are not going to use an exam, then I think it's difficult for people, though, to justify where they can actually show a fairer way of, of, uh, uh, of selection uh, as opposed to simply... If, if somebody is just saying we're, not, we're going to be non-selective, that, in one sense, that, that's entirely fair enough, but it's obviously clearly not a, a particular academic selection ethos in that, in that regard. Uh, and I think it's difficult to, to justify objectively where some schools have made decisions to say that, that their methodology of selection is fairer than it, than it was um, a few weeks ago. OK, I, I'll just finish this out. Look, I think uh, we obviously, across the committee, have been quite robust in different uh, opinions on selection. I think you're, you're, you're quite brave in terms of, 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 of... Not brave, actually, you're just honest in terms of your, your outlook. We had two with Ascalon and CCEA on, and neither of them would take a position, so it just shows you how toxic this debate actually is when you've got members who don't even want to take a position on it, even though they're in the midst of this crisis. But um, I was just, uh, just ask you, just, I'm sure you will, Minister, you'll, you'll just commit to keeping uh, uh, your, your focus on it and trying to give that uh, uh, reassurance and comfort to that P6 cohort that are moving into that, that trial in town now. And if there's anything at all that can be done, we would ask you to uh, just give that confidence to the sector. Thank okay. you. I'm not. I'm not sure, Robbie, uh, what the mythological um, converse of, of Cyclops did only one eye. Uh, but if, if I have to have multiple, I'm keeping. I'm keeping focus on a range of a range of issues which require more than two eyes at any one particular time. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, no thanks problem, Robbie. Thank uh, Catherine thank Kelly. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Minister Derek and John, for for meeting with us again today. Um, firstly, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, I would like to reiterate the need for a robust recovery plan for the child care sector, um, a plan that includes consultation and direction from the reference group. Um, and I hope that the reference group will be able to function um, and, and will remain in place post-June and for as long as it takes for the sector to get back in the feet. Um, financial support and consistent guidance is crucial right now as people begin returning to work and settings begin to reopen. Um, mo moving on just to, to my first question, um, Minister and Derek, it has been raised with me now um, on numerous occasions, um, issues, special school issues, um, and, and one at the minute is the is summer scheme. Will there be summer schemes this year, albeit in a limited capacity? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, just on, first of all, just very briefly on the on the um, the childcare side of it. Deliberately, if you like, childcare wasn't directly referenced in the school recovery side of it because we want to treat that separately. There is ongoing work in connection with that. And I think, Chair, without, I don't think it's telling any tales out of school. I think the executive has acknowledged that there needs to be a specific conversation on childcare beyond simply what's being discussed with regard to school. So, uh, and I think that because I think some of the issues, concerns, and problems that are particularly faced by the childcare sector. Uh, go well, go in a, a different direction, well beyond um, what is there in schools. You know, it is it is plausible to have schools uh, operating on the basis of a mixture of remote learning and having a certain percentage of their pupils in at any one time. As yeah. childcare facilities are quite often uh, private or social enterprises, to be able to actually make them even if anything else financially work in the long run, it's not sustainable to have a, a small proportion of, of children in in a childcare setting. That's why I think there needs to be a, a separate bit. As regards to the, um, the summer scheme side of it, yes, there's ongoing work between EA and particularly health to look at what can be done um, in terms of summer schemes specifically for special educational needs children. Um, I think given current circumstances, that will probably not be able to be pitched at quite the level it's been there in the past, but there's detailed work that's, that's ongoing in connection. I hope that will be brought to a conclusion very quickly. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Good. thanks. Justin? Justin McNulty? You on mute, Justin? Awesome. Justin, you still there? Anybody still there? Are you all still there? <laughs> Minister? Yep. Okay. Yeah, no, look. <laughs> sure, sure. We're, we're at least still here. You're, you're not suddenly hearing a bit. We're, we're uh, all right. All right. the only Just, voice you can hear is your own. <laughs> Justin is at risk. I'll, I'll take his question if you want. No, no, you, you, you're all right. Um, I've, uh, he's at risk of losing his question to, to, to mine here. Justin, one last try. No, okay, Minister. I have a range of issues, but obviously time is extremely short, so I, I may make yep. I may make comment stroke reference to issues as opposed to ask questions and, and give you an opportunity to to respond okay. generally speaking. The um it's fairly clear to me from our consultation with school uh, leaders that your aim and I quote that the work regarding school restart would be progressed during the remainder of this term is not an acceptable time scale. Um, school leaders are advising that they will need clarity around social distancing, sanitization requirements, costs, budgets, signage, etc. by mid-June at the absolute latest. What would your response to that be? Well, look, we are, we are progressing, and part of this actually is work streams involving school leaders, involving... Now, you know, there's got to be a balance here stuck between simply being a situation where if, 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 if we were to put a blueprint out tomorrow, this is the department's view and everything, without talking to anybody, without A, that would probably not be fit for purpose because it doesn't have that le level of engagement. But we would then very quickly be accused of, of simply imposing things on people without level of, of consultation. We will get the information out as quickly as, as, as possible. Uh, some of that will be uh, within the middle of mid-June. I think we're hoping to have all the stuff out uh, in that broader level by June, notwithstanding that you know, there could be developments over the summer which slightly alter some things in, in connection with that, which are in a wider, in a wider context we just don't, don't simply know. So we're, we're moving as quickly as possible in, in relation to this. And look, compared with, say, some other jurisdictions where movement took place and effectively announcement was made and a week or two later schools were open, you know, I think we're trying to take a little bit of time. We're trying to give the maximum level of preparation time in connection with that. But there's got to be a balance struck between engagement and trying to get those views from the ground um, and giving certainty to people as well. Okay, well, to be clear, school leaders regard anything later than mid-June as unacceptable and they also went as far to say that social distancing guidelines of two metres would be potentially unmanageable. Have you any initial reviews with our initial views regards what social distancing distances we will take, may be look, we will in take place? Yeah, in ter look, in terms of social distancing, look, I appreciate the point that's certainly been made in terms of social distancing. That, again, is part of a wider context of where the, the medical and scientific advice, we will be engaging very heavily and, and clearly directly with uh, the key officials in terms of the medical and scientific advice in connection with it. It is certainly the case that in terms of what can be done, social distancing, probably more so, because I think a lot of the other issues are things that are, are relatively resolvable fairly, fairly quickly. Social distancing will be a key element in terms of uh, what can be done and to what extent things can be done. But by the same token, it's, it's not my place, the department's place, to try and sort of impose a different social distancing regime to things that would, would, that would go against, if you like, the direct medical advice. But okay. we've, there's, been a, there's been a bit of an evolving debate across the world in relation to that. We've seen that down south as well. Okay. Uh, school leaders are asking for guidance before mid-June. In terms of childcare, um, a key urgent issue is the discrepancy between the Department of Education definition of key worker and the Department of Health definition of key worker, which is the definition of key worker that applies to access to childcare. Um, can you provide an update in relation to if and when the Department of Health definition of key worker that applies to childcare will be widened well, to the Department of Education definition of key worker? Well, to be fair, it's not that we've taken our own um, off the cuff sort of a definition of key worker. The Department of Education's definition of key worker is, I, I think I'm correct, I may be corrected in relation to this, but I think it's the definition which applies across all departments other than health. Health has been perhaps a little bit out of step. 
I, I think the health minister gave indications in the assembly uh, a short time ago that they were reviewing, I suppose, with the, the idea of effectively bringing themselves into line with that. And I, I would anticipate that fairly imminently on that regard. But in terms of the precise um, actions of, of the health minister, I suppose, to be honest, you'd have to get that directly on. But I would anticipate something happening fairly imminently on that, on that regard. But as, as, as others would have pointed out, that is, if you like, only one part of the jigsaw as regards as regards the wider, longer term. Uh, okay. Route in okay. Terms okay. In terms of application, how concerned are you that there's only been fifty percent um, of settings have applied um, for the fund, and that we are sitting at only two hundred and sixty thousand pounds of the twelve million pound fund allocated today? Well, from from that point of view, we will get we we'll certainly get the money out. I know the reference group is, is working with that um, in connection with it. And if there is any barriers uh, to that, we will do what we can to remove it. We're not directly running the scheme, but I think the money will ultimately be spent um, on that basis. Ultimately, you, you, as with anything, you can't force anybody to apply against against their will on it. But we want to make sure that whatever process is there is easy as possible. No, Derek wants to. Yeah, chair. Just very briefly. I mean, you, you've seen the stats, and we have a much higher proportion of applications from Chinese minders, where the payments tend to be quite small. Uh, you know, averaging around three hundred pounds. So the payments are going to be small there. Fifty percent of the applications have been processed, so the money will go out, but it goes out in cycles. So I think you'll find that more money will have gone out you know, the next time we report. The reference group is looking at the uptake from the settings to see what's going on there, to see if any encouragement can be offered or indeed needs to be offered. But at the end of the day, we cannot force applications to come in. Okay. Uh, in terms of special educational needs, um, from the data that you've given us in the situation report on the 22nd of May 2020, the number of children with a statement of special educational needs in special school was 22 and in school was 90. A total of 112 pupils in school on that day in terms of children with special educational needs statement. Um, is that a concern? And how much more information can you provide with regards to what services are being put in place for that significant number of children with SEND statements who clearly aren't in school? Chair, can I, can I maybe jump in there? Um, yeah, it is a concern. I mean, we have always been concerned about the generality of vulnerable children and specifically special education needs children, and we know that, and we've discussed it on a number of occasions. And there are lots of structures being put in place to look at this. We are hopeful, and I think it might be mentioned in the written report, that more special schools will be opening. More have actually been opening than has been the case in previous weeks, so that services can be ramped up. It's very difficult to give specifics about services that are being provided to individual children, because they will be different in each and individual, each individual case. I think the written report that we've given you um, tries to provide a range of information about the contacts between the education authorities, various services for vulnerable children to show the volumes that are being catered for. But I, I will have a look yet again without wanting to disclose the details of individuals about the services that are being put in place for, children, for um, special education needs children outside of special education needs schools. Okay, okay. Final, final question. Uh, Minister, um, members have already alluded to five uh, schools in the Newry area at Lagan College suspending the use of transfer tests for admissions 2021. You've also received a call from 24 primary school principals in the North Down and Strangford area um, for tests to be suspended. You maintain that transfer tests remain inappropriate and in the best interests of children in the current context? Sorry, that's a question. Uh, yeah, well, take, take you a little bit more of a statement, but I suppose I'll, I'll respond to that. Look, the point, the point is made, and I think, look, I, I've already indicated, I think, to be fair, I can see Lagan College's position that they are not largely speaking using they were using it for a minority of their thing, of their pupils anyway. The point, I suppose, is are people actually, if you're going to say that a transfer test doesn't take place, there's an onus on people to say what a fairer system is. 
And specifically, if you look at the schools, uh, and every school is perfectly entitled to use whatever methodology it wants. But if you take a look at the schools in Uri and Kilkeel, you look at their sub-criteria, which has been flagged up as the route down which they are going to do by selection. Which is the same as primary school criteria, by and large. So, so do you believe, Chair, maybe I could put the question back to you, do you think it's fair that somebody gets a grammar school place on the basis of who they're related to? The, the criteria, is that, well, that, that's, that's, not, that, that's not the only, that's not the only criteria that can be used. Except, 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 Chair, if you look at it, in all five schools, the top three criteria in all five of them is who you're related to, and in four out of the five, it's who you're related to. It is whether, whether your mother or father is a staff member, whether, whether you have a, a sibling directly at the school, whether you are in a, a situation where a, a sibling is a former member, whether your mum and dad went there. It is hereditary grammar school places. Okay. And so consequently, and consequently, if you are going to say uh, that the test should not be used, produce a fairer system. And frankly, look, I appreciate, I think there are good concerns that have been raised about whether we necessarily have a 100% level playing field in terms of everything with the test. But here's the, here's the, here's the issue. Uh, as opposed to use something that we just may, may appreciate a different, a different way on it. The tests that have been used whenever you simply have what, your, what relations went to the school or connections up with that, it's both an accident of birth, it actually means you don't even get onto the, the playing field, let alone be able to say whether it's level or not. Okay, Cri criteria that I, I think is used widely across other, a range of other schools across Northern Ireland, that the, your sibling is not the only criteria that can be used. And Minister, you say there is an onus to come forward with alternatives. <coughs> You're right. You're the Minister for Education. Come forward with them. Because I, I've, I've already indicated, Chair, that I believe that this is a better al alternative than anything else. I mean, look, if I believe that the best alternative is largely speaking the status quo with whatever mitigation measures, then it is for others to actually produce what the alternatives are. And you say okay. in terms of siblings... Okay. No, most of, most of the schools at Princeton, and Uri and Kilkeel are single-sex schools. So, for example, uh, as somebody who has an older sister, uh, had I been applying to the school that, that I went to and that was applied, I'd be disadvantaged because my older sibling was female, as opposed to perhaps somebody down the street whose older sibling was male. Or indeed somebody who was an only child, doesn't have a sibling at all. Or indeed things... So, you know, if, if we're talking about having something which entrenches the idea of um, perpetuating simply the same people going to the same schools. If we are saying actually that we want to have a more egalitarian society, putting up the barriers which says who your family is, what relationship they have, is actually one which actually stops social mobility. So, you know, that's, that's the point. People have got to, if they are saying there's a different way of doing this, they have got to actually produce something which is fairer. And if, if you're keen to stand over a, a system which says an accident of birth creates actually which, which, whether you get into a particular grammar school or not, then I think that's a very difficult position to justify. A criteria that is, is used across you know, most other schools in Northern Ireland. I think what you're suggesting is that... And prim, and prim, so you need to let me speak. Different. You need to yeah. let me respond. It sounds to me what you're suggesting is there's a need for a fundamental review of education in Northern Ireland. So hopefully you'll you'll get on with that as well. I need to bring uh, this part of the session to, which, to, a close. to which to which to which both myself and the department are are committed in that in that regard on it. And again, I don't know whether uh, on that basis then you're saying that all grammar schools should be abolished. But we'll maybe leave that for no, another day. Well, I mean. It... <laughs> It's laughable that you continue to say that, Minister, if it wasn't so serious. I have a no well, except, point... Except, except, well, except, are you going to let except. me speak? I have at no point said that cram and a grammar approach to education should be abolished. I think we need but to leave it there, you, given the level do, do of you believe, debate Chair, you're getting do you into. Believe, Chair, okay. do, you believe, do you believe, Chair, in the, the abolition of academic selection? I, I believe there should be a different approach to post-primary transfer, yes. All right, so I you mean, believe in the abolition of academic selection, that, but you I'm, also believe are, in the grammar there, school. There are no there, 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 there does appear to be there does appear to be chair a certain amount of, of having your cake and eating it. No, I don't. There are non-selective grammar schools in Northern Ireland, Minister. You'll be aware of. So 
I don't know what you're, where you're going with this. I, I, I have been reprimanded for my timekeeping in this committee, okay. so I, I apologise. I'm going to have to bring us to a close today. But we are extremely, genuinely, extremely grateful for the level of detail that is provided in the weekly Department of Education update to this committee via the Situation Report and via your oral briefings, Minister and Permanent Secretary. So thank you very much indeed for that. And Chair, and Chair on, that, on that note of harmony, I would say thank you, thank you as well to the committee. OK, thank you. OK, members. Chair, can I sign off at this point to go to get ready for the Communities yes, Committee? Yes, th thanks, thank uh, thanks, Robert. Thank OK, Clark, I realise we have minutes to try and round up. Apologies for that. Um, I did my best today. Um, we will get better. Clark. OK, Chairperson, so in terms of writing to the department, I think we're um, urging them to issue guidance to uh, schools by mid-June, asking them for a breakdown of the PPE and other equipment that they're asking for uh, to allow schools to return um, under the Restart programme. Um, we're just also asking them to set out the um, ring fencing of the reprioritised budget, so the issue that uh, Deputy Chairperson mentioned earlier. And we previously asked for further information on uh, laptops, and also maybe we're asking for an update on holiday hunger and the meeting with the uh, Department for the Communities, if members are content with that. Agreed. Members? Agreed. Agreed, yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thanks. The chair, there's a couple of other things, which just if we can get through really right. quickly, if that's yep. OK. Um, the SITREP includes uh, an explanation relating to the isolation of children with COVID uh, symptoms. The department has come back. Uh, I suspect members will want to think about this a little more. But in the meantime, are you content for me to at least forward the relevant information back to the yeah, initiator? Yeah, Clark and, and members, that, that correspondence appears to clarify from the Department of Education's point of view that should any pupil um, require isolation due to COVID-19 uh, symptoms, that a member of staff in suitable PPE equipment um, ought to accompany that uh, pupil so as they are not in, in, in solitary isolation. Hopefully that's helpful clarification for um, concerned parents. Thanks, Clark. Uh, so, uh, Chairperson, then moving on to page 287, there's um, correspondence from the Governing Bodies Association who have declined to brief the committee. Uh, can I ask, are the committee content to defer this uh, indefinitely then? Yes, I don't think we've any choice. Members of the GBA have declined to um, brief the committee in relation to post-primary transfer, so we can return to other issues with them in due course. Content? Yeah. 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 Okay. It's not. It's not particularly helpful, but it is what it is. Okay. Thank you. Page two hundred ninety-three. The ERA committee has written around um, uh, access to broadband issues and they're seeking the committee's views on things. Um, I propose just to go back to them, comment on the things that we can comment on. So the committee is, hasn't dealt with Project Stratum, but it can certainly talk about the uh, DE's project to loan and repurpose several thousand laptops and uh, iPads. And also we have previously sought information about the rollout of broadband access technology. And I think the committee has previously indicated its views that the limitations of technology and broadband are a key consideration as part of the restart programme. If members are content to respond to the ERA community, committee in those terms. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Can we move on Agreed. to correspondence? Yeah, can I, Clark? Um, members, the, our response to our correspondence with selective schools in relation to post primary transfer has been uh, limited. Um, could I uh, seek members' views um, whether they wish to issue a post-primary transfer online survey directed at parents and pupils, teachers, representative bodies, uh, post-primary schools, um, you know, open, open response um, issue uh, in order to garner views with regards to post-primary transfer? Is that, is that the proposal, Clark? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we, uh, the committee discussed this previously. So as you're aware, the Committee for the, Communi for the Economy had issued um, an online survey around the energy strategy, I think. Um, so we could do something similar um, and I could then come back to the committee in a week or two's time with some uh, appropriate questions, open questions, which maybe we could put out near the end of June when maybe the position might be a little bit clearer. Members agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay, thanks, agreed. So in terms of correspondence then, if you're content, Chairperson, yep, if members are so content to dispose of the correspondence in line with the um, note um, that um, I've provided. Members content? 
Agreed, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, agreed. And if, there's, if you check the correspondence, if there's any issues that we need to return to, we can do that next week. But like, thanks for that agreement. Okay, Clark? So, uh, forward work program then, members. It's proposed that next week um, so the department has written to us about a transfer of functions order. I think it's largely technical, but the committee will have to give its views in plenary. So, it's proposed we would have a short briefing from the department about that next week. Follow that with Nikki, and um, and uh, then again we may attempt to have a, a much shorter briefing from the department on COVID matters. And if members are content with that approach. Or do you think that's overly ambitious? Do you want to spend a bit more time with Nikki next week? And thus say, so what you could have then is we'll have to have the Sandus briefing. Then we could have Nikki. Maybe that would just do us. What, what, what's the, what's the, the time scale urgency with regards to the transfer of functions order? Clark? Something will come to the um, something will come to plenary before the end, before summer recess, and okay. we will have to write back to the TEO committee. I think indicating our views. Is that a short that. briefing? Yeah, I believe it will be. Okay. They assure me that it's members technical. content. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay great. Then, so we'll get DE. So then the following week, um, what I'm suggesting is you take a briefing on the 17th of June on the budget and June monitoring round, um, assuming that that information is available at that point, and that would then be followed by the EA um, report on its uh, report on statementing. So I'd be suggesting on the 17th that you wouldn't have an update uh, from the department because I think the EA briefing might be quite lengthy. Oh, okay. We can, can, can we return to that next week okay, just to then. confirm that, Clark? Yeah, okay. Um, so, therefore, the proposal, okay, so therefore on the 24th of June, what I'm suggesting you would do there is have the youth forum um, and then the EA youth service, since okay. the governing bodies association aren't coming, and then you'd have the department talking about COVID. So, that would be and quite actually. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Sure, sorry, I, I literally, my phone dropped out for about two minutes, sir. Um, I just wanted, to, uh, just wanted to see if we agreed on just before I finish. So, um, we're just, yeah, we, we need to we need to vacate the room, Robbie. I, yeah, I can update you in person afterwards if you've if there's key stuff you've missed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, Clark. And then finally, on the first of July, um, it's suggested that we would uh, put in Noel Purdy on the Stimulus University College to talk about online issues and blended learning and all that good stuff okay. with um, the um, uh, doing its usual briefing. So therefore. Uh, final thing is that we would move our start time to nine o'clock until we get the summer recess. Agreed, and I think we can sit to one o'clock from next week, which will help um, us get through business in a more comprehensive manner. Okay. Yeah, just go to AOB. If, yeah. If Any I... other business members? Yeah, no. Okay. No. I'm happy enough. Okay. Um, happy to speak to members afterwards if there's any other outstanding issues there. Th thanks so much for your. Uh, cooperation and uh, performance today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This Bye. is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.